morning, Kobe. Uh, good morning, Joe. How are you today? I'm good. Great. So we got everybody online here, getting ready to start. Let's see, Commissioner Baker, uh, Commissioner Enders, uh, Commissioner Hill, Commissioner Beasley. Yes. Yes. You're here. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, Commissioner Rojas. Let's see, looking for Commissioners Allender and Sadowski. I don't see them yet, Kobe. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. There's Commissioner Allender. Just waiting on uh, Commissioner Sandowski. Sorry I'm late, everybody. Still celebrating the Chiefs win, huh? Joe, do you think we're ready to go? I'd like, like go ahead and get started if we can. Yeah, and here's that now. So. Okay. So I believe everybody's on the line. Uh, so welcome to the October 6, 2020 City Planning Commission meeting. As we get started, there are a couple of announcements I want to make. Uh, first, thank you for your patience during this unprecedented times. As we navigate through this pandemic, we want to make sure we provide the best venue and opportunity to address land use improvements and changes for the constituents of Kansas City, Missouri. Our meetings are now back to virtual and will be in this format until the pandemic emergency order ends. Uh, because of this, we've implemented time limits uh, of the cases. Uh, we here, we're expecting five minutes for staff presentations, 20 minutes for applicants, and two minutes for individual members from the public or five minutes from those representing a larger group, HOA or community. These time limits will be enforced beginning today. So I encourage everyone to be clear yet brief. Uh, if anybody has any comments regarding this, please uh, let Mr. Rexwinkle know. Uh, next, there's a call for artists for the Maple Woods Parkway project. And soon there'll probably be a call for artists for the, for the airport. Um, my next announcement is the city is updating the comprehensive plan. The plan is called the Casey Spirit Playbook, which anyone can access through the uh, city's website, playbook 
www.kcmo.gov. I encourage you to go there uh, and go frequently because things will be updated on a regular basis. Um, and in the upcoming meetings, I haven't talked with everybody on the commission yet about this, but I'm hoping that we can help come up with a prototype uh, for development in Kansas City, uh, and just from a commissioner's perspective. And we'll talk about that uh, as future meetings go on. So with that, let's go ahead and begin today's meeting. Um, the Kansas City, Missouri City Planning Commission and Planning Department are committed to community engagement and keeping the development of our community moving forward. We've chosen to hold our meetings by video conference to make sure as many voices are heard on our projects uh, before us. As we get started, I wanna ask uh, staff to briefly provide some ground rules and instructions for us to ensure that the you know, minimal disruption and maximum clarity. So Joe, can you uh, please remind us of those ground rules? Sure, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the main rules are to, if you are a applicant, when the case is called or you're a member of the applicant team, um, as soon as I call the case, raise your hand and then I will be able to promote you um, over into a panelist position. And this will allow you to be seen and heard by the commission and other attendees. Um, the same would be true for any citizen wishing to provide testimony. Um, when the planner starts presenting the case would be a good time for you to raise your hand. That way I know that you want to testify and we will call your name um, when the chair opens the public hearing. Um, another ground rule to keep, um, keep aware of is to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, the picking up a background noise can be pretty disruptive. So um, when you're not speaking, make sure you're muted and then unmute yourself when you're ready to speak. And that's it, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Joe. And then is there, if somebody bombs the meeting or whatever, what's the protocol for that? If someone what? Sorry. Uh, interrupts the meeting and, and does uh, uh, just try to interrupt the meeting itself. We'll probably end the whole thing, won't we? And then re-log re back in. Right. I mean, the way you're talking about like Zoom bombing and stuff like yes, that. That's um, <clears throat> we um, have been fortunate to not have that with planning commission. And I think it's largely due to the, the fact that we, that all attendees are simply attendees, um, except for the planning commission and staff. So that, that changes when I promote you to a panelist. Um, so when you're promoted to a panelist, you can um, share your camera and your audio and um, of course be disruptive at that point. But I think because um, we promote people temporarily and then promote them back or demote for lack of a better term back to an attendee, um, we haven't encountered that. Sure, but we should be able to we should be able to avoid that if it ever happens by individually muting and that person back to an attendee role or kicking them out of the meeting. Okay. Instead of shutting down the whole thing. All right, very good. So let's go ahead and get started with the docket. And, and the first item on the docket was a memo uh, supplied by uh, your, your department, Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, my opinion is very informative, uh, some good information to have before us. Um, I think it's timely as well. I'm just going to see if any of the commissioners have any questions uh, with about any of that information before we move forward with our docket items. Okay. Um, Seeing none, uh, again, thank you for putting that together so that we have that and Good. can refer to from time to time. So let's go ahead and get started with our meeting. Do you wanna start with the consent agenda items? Sure, and I'm sharing the screen. So if that helps people identify which case we're on. Um, the very first one, docket item C1, case number final plat 2020-00024, Benson Place Landing second plat. Staff is recommending approval with conditions. Docket item C2, staff is recommending continuance of to October 20th without fee. And that is case number CPC 2020-00130, the Village of Green Hills project plan. Docket item C3 is final plat 2020-00028, Blue Parkway Town Center fourth plat. Staff is recommending approval with conditions. 
Docket item C4, case number final plat 2020 -0016. Forest Ridge Villas Apartments. Staff is recommending approval. Hey, Joe. Yes. This is all of food. Can you uh, continue C4 to uh, 1020? Okay. They paid their fee late, so. It's well, let's pull that off then because the commission's going to vote as, as written on the docket. So we're going to have to pull that out then. Okay. C5, case number final plat 2020-00030, North New Valley third plat. Staff recommends approval with conditions. And docket item C6, case number final plat 2020-00029 for Theodore Jack Court. Staff recommends approval of this one without conditions. So, Mr. Chair, it's docket item C1 through C6 as stated on the agenda except for C4. Okay. Uh, does any commissioners have any questions about any of these projects? Okay, seeing none, do we have anybody from the public that would like to speak on any of these projects? Let me uh, bear with me just one moment, Mr. Chair. Sure. I don't see anyone from the public that wants to speak. Okay. So with that, I'll go ahead and take a motion. Um, I motion to um, approve with conditions, docket item C1, C3, C5, C6, and to continue without a fee, docket item C2, all as stated on the docket. Okay, so I have a motion from Commissioner Baker. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second from Commissioner Sadowski. Uh, Lisa, do you mind taking roll call on this motion, please? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Corral? Aye. Anders? Aye. Hill? Aye. Rojas? Aye. And Sadowski. Aye. Okay, so it looks like the motion passes for C1, C2, uh, sorry, C1, C3, C5, C6 approved with uh, the conditions listed and continuance of C2 to 1020. So now we're going to take up docket item C4. Um, do we need to discuss this or? Uh, only if we oh. need to. I don't think we do. I believe Olaf who suggested it needs to be continued October 20th. Is that right, O? That's correct. Is that without a fee? Without a fee. Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead, Mr. Baker, if you'd like to make um, a motion, please. I move to continue docket item C4 to uh, October 20th without a fee. Okay, so I have a motion from Mr. Baker. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, Lisa, do you mind taking a roll call, please? That was Commissioner Hill, right, that made the second? Correct. Thank you. Okay. I was just about to ask the same. Um, Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Crow? Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. Rojas? Commissioner Rojas? Aye. Uh -huh. And Sadowski? Aye. Okay, it looks like motion passes for docket item C4 to be continued to October 20th meeting. So, if you don't mind now, Joe, let's go ahead and look at our cases to be continued. All right, Mr. Chair, the first case to be continued is docket item one, which is three companion cases starting with 1.1, case number CPC 2020-00107, which is a request to amend the Riverfront Industrial Area Plan. 
located at 455 Donnelly Avenue and 456 Wallace Avenue. Docket item 1.2, case number CPC 2020-00108, which is a, a request to approve a rezoning at 456 Wallace Avenue. And docket item 1.3, which is case number CPC 2020-00133, which is a request to approve a development plan um, in lieu of, which acts as a special use permit or in lieu of a special use permit for a gas station. Um, at this location. Staff is recommending these cases be continued to October 20th without fee. Okay, you want to go ahead and read all of the continuances and we'll just make one motion? Yeah, I was just getting ready to ask you if that's what you wanted me to do. Yes, so please. Doc, the next one is docket item three, case number SUP 2020-00024 at 13423 Charlotte Street, request for a special use permit for a um, non-accessory parking lot. Staff is recommending continuance of that case to October 20th without fee. Next one is docket six, case number CPC 2020-00132, Fairway Meat Market Phase 1, which is located at the corner of 79th and Ward Parkway. Staff is recommending continuance to October 20th without fee. Docket item 13, case number um, one, two, I'm sorry, case number CPC 2020-00065, located at 12200 North Ambassador Drive, um, which is a request um, to rezone property um, at the Northwest, or at Northwest Cookingham Drive and North Ambassador Drive. The companion case for this is 13.2, case number CPC 2020-00067 at the same location to approve a revised um, development plan. Staff is recommending continuance of these, or the applicant actually is requesting continuance of this case to December 1st, and staff recommends without fee. Sorry, there's also a third companion case, which is CPC 2020-00066, um, which is a request for oversized monument signs. Same day, continuance of December 1st without fee. That brings us down to docket item 14, case number SUP 2020-00042 at 5100 North Highland Avenue. It's a request for a special use permit for a new elementary school. Applicants requesting continuous October 20th without fee. Docket item 16, case number SUP 2020-00043 located at 6400 Northeast 52nd Street for a special use permit for a new school. Um, staff is, or yeah, staff is recommending continuous to October 20th without fee. Uh, docket item 19, case number CPC 2020-00140, request to approve a development plan to allow multiple structures on one lot on 38 acres at 107th and Lane Avenue. Staff is recommending continuous October 20th. Docket item 20, case number CPC 2020-00138, Blue Oak Learning Academy. Um, is a proposed development at the northwest corner of 72nd North Wacomas. Staff is recommending continuous to October 20th without fee. And then docket items 21 through 26, I believe, are all to be continued, starting with 21. Case number CPC 2020-00131-114 West Gregory Boulevard, continued to November 17th without fee. Docket item 22, case number SUP 2020-00035, the Copac and Brooks surface parking lot is proposed to be continued to October 20th without fee. Docket item 23, case number SUP 2020-00038 at 106.36 Walrond Avenue, a request for a special use permit for a short-term rental proposed to be continued October 20th without fee. Docket item 24, case number SUP 2020-00039 at 106.38 Bales Avenue, special use permit for a short-term rental, proposed to be continued October 20th without fee. Docket item 25, case number SUP 2020-00040 at 3501 East 106th Terrace, a special use permit for a short-term rental, also proposed to be continued October 20th. Um, and then finally, docket item 26, which probably should be back there with number, I believe it is number number one, maybe, um, is a request for dismissal. Um, Zach, can you jump in and what's the docket item number for the companion cases here? It's 1.1 through 1.3. Right. 
So this is related, um, commissioners, to docket items 1.1 through 1.3. Um, it just got placed at the end of the docket, and this one's for dismissal. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, Joe, by chance, did we miss docket item 18? It looks like it's going to be continued to November 3. We sure did. Um, docket item 18 is case number SUP 2020-00034 at 7445 Prospect Avenue, a special use permit for a gas station and convenience store. Um, staff is recommending continuance. Um, this will have to be to November 17th. It says the third on the docket. That's right. That's right. Just for anybody who remembers there's an important day going on November 3rd. And so we will not be meeting uh, that day due to the election. Okay, uh, so looks like there's several cases to be continued as stated in the agenda. Does any of the commissioners have any questions about any of these cases to be continued? Okay, so uh, Joe, is there anybody from the public that has any comments or anything on the continuances of all of these cases? Um, I do see one person has raised their hand. Okay. It's Greg Fowl, so I'm gonna go ahead and promote him. Greg, go ahead. Joe, can you hear us? Yes. yes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Chris Maddox from Rouse for Ethical uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, Patrick Hanley and Melanie Dean for item number 20, the Blue Oak Learning Academy. Um, we, we did receive the DRC uh, staff report and we uploaded revised plans uh, that address some of the comments that came in at DRC, including uh, revisions to our uh, stream buffer plan. And uh, we were hoping that we could move forward with that case today. We do have a number of members from the public who are strongly in support of our plan. Uh, most of them, I think, have written letters in support, but there may be a few members of the public who are hoping to testify today. Okay. Uh, so, Joe, can you, so docket item number 20 is being requested to be continued to uh, the next meeting, is that's a, a staff recommendation or is that the actual applicant recommendation? Mr. Chairman, Olafu Agbaji, let me turn on my uh, video. Okay. This is my case. Um, the DRC recommended that this case be continued to uh, the uh, October 20th meeting for, to allow them to submit a stream buffer plan, which they did, which has been routed for review thereby I need to get these comments back. We do not have these comments back yet. So, and there are additional uh, comments and concerns that we had shared with him, which he had submitted a revised plan. So this is to give us time to go through our comments and probably reduce them. And I have a meeting scheduled with Mr. Maddox. When is our meeting, Chris? Thursday or Friday? Thursday, October 8th. Yeah, so we have a meeting scheduled to go over those comments from DRC, hopefully to take care of the ones he's addressed and then uh, take care of those before coming to CPC. So there is no staff report. He does have all the comments, but there's no staff report accompanying this. And the recommendation from DRC was to continue all along, so. Okay. So it sounds like, uh, apologize, uh, Mr. Maddox, but uh, we won't be able to hear the case today because we don't have the staff report and it sounds like there's a couple of items that might need to be discussed uh, yet. Uh, and so those that are here for public testimony, I prefer that we not take that at this time until after we've heard the case so that the commission has a better understanding of what the actual case is about um, and it can help put things together from from those of the public. The, the applicant certainly understands. Um, hey, and all through real quick, um, when we requested that meeting for Thursday, I think we were only able to request it in 15 minute increments. Uh, is it possible to set aside some additional time? I think it might benefit both, both sides if we set aside at least an hour. Yeah, 
after the meeting today, based on, I think you requested multiple uh, uh, departments and division, I will go in and probably schedule a separate meeting for an hour or so. Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, is there anybody else that's maybe raised their hand uh, about the continuance of any of these cases, Joe? No. Okay, uh, so with that, so whoever gets to make the motion, hopefully you recall uh, all the different cases that are being continued today and can recite those. So I will, I will try. <laughs> Chair Crow, I move that uh, docket items 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 3, uh, docket item 6, 13.1, 13 13.2, 13.3, 13 14, 16, 18, 19, docket items 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26 be continued as stated. Well, it's 20, be continued as stated with the exception of uh, docket item 26 being continued. I mean, uh, denied. Dismissed. Dismissed. Yeah. Yes. Dismissed, sorry. Very good. <laughs> so I have a motion. Do I have a second for, for those? Second. So a uh, motion from Commissioner Hill and a second from Commissioner Sadowski. Uh, Lisa, do you mind taking a roll call, please? Commissioner Allender. Aye. Baker. Aye. Beasley. Aye. Crowell. Aye. Enders. Aye. Hill. Aye. Rojas. Aye. And Sadowski. Aye. All right. So motion passes for all those cases to be continued to the dates stated on the actual docket. So with that, I believe that takes us back to docket item number two as our first case to hear today. Good morning, everyone. This is Shu, staff planner. Okay. Joe, do you mind I... introducing the case first? Yep. Yes. Sorry. sorry, Joe. Sorry, Shu. That's okay. She's very eager. Um, <laughs> docket, <laughs> item, docket item two um, is two companion cases starting with 2.1. Case number CPC 2020-00126. Request to approve an area plan amendment. Um, for property located at 2613 Benton Boulevard and docket item 2.2. .2. Case number CPC 2020-00100. Request to approve a rezoning of the same property from District R1.5 to District 0 0.75. Um, she would, again, is the staff planner. Thanks, Joe. I'm gonna share my PowerPoint here in one second. So this case in front of you have two companion cases. One is for the rezoning request, which is the case 00100. And the other one is the area plan amendment request, which is the 00126. Here's the general location of the property. More specifically, it's located at, on the east side of Benton Boulevard between East 26th Street and East 27th Street. So currently the zoning is R1.5 and you can see it's R1.5 along Benton Boulevard, along this corridor. Here's the view looking east from Benton Boulevard at the subject site. The subject site has one of this colonnade building, which has uh, four unit and it's vacant currently. It is in this yellowish um, color and the property adjacent to it directly to the north is currently vacant. There are colonnade apartments uh, to the north and south, and there is also church used to the south along the same, on the same block. On the other side of the Benton Boulevard, um, the majority of the building types are single family or duplex. So there is no uniform characteristic of the building types along Benton Boulevard, but they're all zoned R1.5. So currently, um, the subject site has near 5,000 square feet, which under the current zoning classification would allow three units. 
there is a uh, CLNU, which is a certificate of legal non-conforming use that allows this property to have four units. The applicant proposes to demolish the existing building due to the condition of the building and to rebuild a six unit uh, colonnade apartments. First, the building plan the applicant provided. The building footprint pretty much stays the same as the existing building. Uh, the building height is about 30 feet, which is a little bit higher, um, a little bit taller than the existing building, but not much. Then they are generally complying with a lot in building standards. However, uh, I want to mention that the first thing when we consider about zoning is um, if it complies with the area plan amendment, uh, if it complies with the area plan recommendation. At this location, the area plan recommends residential urban low density, which corresponds to um, zoning classification R5, R7.6, R7 and R10. So the applicant is proposing to rezone it from R1.5 to R0.75, which is a higher density. It does not comply with the area plan. And that's one of the reasons you see that the area plan amendment is required. And it's at one of this companion case. So staff is not in support with this area plan amendment. Uh, one of the, another reason is because along this corridor, most of the properties are zoned R1.5 and most of the property do comply with this zoning district already. So simply zoning one subject site um, will be a spot zoning, which is um, against or discouraged by the city policy. And another reason when staff review uh, this plan not in support is due to the lack of the enough um, off-street parking. So at this location, parking requirement uh, stated one per unit. So for six units, we would require six parking spots, even though the staff, even though the applicant did provide affordable housing, which is a good thing here, but affordable housing, uh, when we consider parking lot, the exemption for affordable housing only applies to multifamilies that's over 10 units. So there is not enough parking spots. And these are some elevations provided by the applicant. Um, they are mostly stay in the colonnade style still. And the west elevation is where it's facing Benton Boulevard. And again, there are six units, two on each floor. So this is a floor plan provided by the applicant, two units on each floor and each unit is about 900 square feet. Uh, through all the review and consideration, staff recommended denial of this application due to the reason I uh, provided earlier. Um, it is a tough decision, um, but I'm open to questions. I believe the applicant has a presentation as well, whenever you're ready. Okay, are there any questions from the commission uh, for staff? Um, Shu, I just want to make sure I understand the building that they're proposing is roughly the same footprint as what was there and roughly the same height, just slightly taller. Correct. Okay. Because the old colonnades, typically they do have like the servant's room kind of in the basement area. So mm -hmm. even though staff defined that we only have four units, they might have extra unit rooms before due to the history of it. But okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Correct. Uh, it's oh. Commissioner Allender. I uh, just want to confirm, did you say they're all affordable housing units? Um, I'm not sure how many affordable housing units there are, and that might be a good question for the applicant, but I, the applicant did mention they are providing affordable housing units. Thank you. Um, this is uh, Chair Crowell. I had just a question. Can you remind me again uh, the use of the buildings on either side of this proposed project? Yeah. Or are they both single family or are they multifamily now? So on this side of Benton Boulevard, um, let me share this screen. It might be a little more clear. So 
so the subject site is this um, property that has this yellowish pen with the brick co columns. And directly to the north, it's a vacant lot currently. And there are two more colonnade apartments. I believe both of them are four units uh, north of the vacant lot on the same block. And there is another colonnade um, directly south to the subject site. And then there's a church used uh, south of that colonnade. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for staff? Yeah, this is Commissioner Enders. Uh, is your concern um, more about the spot zoning than the parking, or does parking actually weigh heavily in this? And then with spot zoning is the fear that because there's a vacant and because the other structures nearby are probably of similar um, age that they potentially might also have issues where someone might want to come in and all of a sudden we have um, proposals for four more lots on that side of the street? That could be one of the situation. That's a very good question. Um, like I said, it is a tough judgment for staff. And we had an internal meeting with long range planners who make recommendations on future land use. Um, that is one of the reason that we considered heavily because the future land use is a recommendation drafted by the neighborhood. So a large, that which represents a large group of people's um, opinion over here. So spot zoning is one of the reasons that we considered um, to zone it from R1.5 to R0.75. So if it does have, let's say this whole block or half of the block do consider about having a higher density, maybe would have considered it a little differently. But parking really isn't um, that heavily considered by staff mostly just because it's, they're not that short on parking. It doesn't deviate that much from the requirement. Anyway, it looks like they're providing four to five spots. And another thing is they could um, ask for a variance from the parking. And we do appreciate that they consider affordable housing for these units. Um, even though according to our code, the parking can only be reducted uh, if they have 10 or more, more than 10 units uh, for the affordable housing. But that's it really just it really this is Joe it really just boils down to the policy recommendation in the long range plan and I don't know Shu if you showed them um, the map of can you guys see a map on your screen now yes yeah yeah okay. well you just took it off put it back there you go <laughs> um, the property is is right here and the yellow shading is the land use policy recommendation from the area plan and it supports low density urban low density residential which does not support the proposed zoning um so you know they can't build that what it boils down to is you can't rebuild what's there now under current zoning so you have to rezone and the proposed rezoning doesn't support it by policy okay so you just confused me this is forest thing so my question is, is it because it, they want to go from four units to six units that they need to change the zoning and, and try to do the spot zone, zoning? They can't rebuild a four unit building? Shu, is it density on? and building type or just the density? Did you hear me, Shu? Yes, uh, they can build three unit building because the lot area they only have is about uh, near 5,000 square feet. Because our 1.5 basically meaning we require 1,500 square feet per unit. So the building type is allowed. We do allow multifamily here. It's the number of units that we don't allow that many. And if they do want to build a four unit, um, we will have to double check the CLNU, see if that certificate of legal nonconforming um, still see if it's still valid. If it is, they can board, they can build four unit. If it is not, they can only build a three unit. But they want a six units. That's why they're requesting to rezone it to R0.75. Did I answer your question? You did. So it's because they want to go to six that we're looking at rezoning that would cause a spot zoning. Correct. But if they did three to possibly four, we wouldn't have that issue. Correct. 
And okay. uh, this thank you. Question to Joe. I'm just curious with the area plans, do you see this a lot with down zoning and existing neighborhoods where people are not allowed to build back exactly to the same density? Yeah, but we see it more often where um, the lots are made non-conforming and the density is impacted, like, like it is in this case, but even where there's like duplexes not allowed because of the density, the building type might be allowed, but the density isn't. That's more okay. common. Okay. So the this is Beasley again. So the other thing I heard was the square footage per unit would change with the new building they want to construct. Didn't I hear it was like nine something with the old one and they want to do 1500 with the new one? No, the 1500 per unit is the requirement for the okay. lot area per, for the lot area per unit, not the building footprint, the lot area. And when they want to change it to 0 0.75, they want to change it to the requirement to 750 square feet per unit for the lot area. And that's what it was with the old one? The old, stu the old structure was 750 per unit? No, the old structure has four units on it. So it's roughly, it has about 5,000 square feet in the land area. So that's roughly about probably a little over 1,200 square feet land area per unit. So the zoning basically reflects to the requirement of the land area, not really considering how big the uh, units are not for the foot building footprint. Okay, any other questions uh, for staff? So let's go ahead and introduce the applicant. Uh, applicant, welcome. Uh, thank you. My name is Travis Wilson of Veritas Architecture and Design. Uh, so I represent the, the clients. Uh, my clients in this um, ownership group is less um, legacy asset management. Um, it's a local, uh, a local group of, of developers. Um, and so just as the architect, they've asked me to you know, present this plan uh, for the commission. So um, as Ms. Wood said, right, like that, that is our goal is to lay this, um, this building in and take out the existing building and build a new uh, six unit building. So whenever the owners originally bought the property, their plan was just to simply rehab what was there. And just from years of, of the building being vacant, the, uh, it just isn't reparable. The, the roof actually caved in and took the second floor down to the ground. So now it's like walls and a big empty cavernous box over there. So um, so, so restoring the existing building is not an option. Um, so we started looking at it and we said, you know, we what we could do here to provide a little bit more uh, affordable housing in this area would be to, to recreate a six flex building. Um, and so that's, that's what we felt like would fit. Uh, as you can see, and as Commissioner Sadowski mentioned earlier, we are fitting within the basically the existing footprint and the overall height. So while we are asking for rezoning to 0.75, we're asking it only so that we can put a few more units on the site. Uh, we're not trying to increase the overall size of the building. There's other, you know, by going from 1.5 to 0.75, we could in, in theory, you know, make the building a lot taller or whatever. So we're trying to com comply with all of the existing uh, requirements of, of how it's zoned now, while just addition, adding a few units. Um, so that's that's the goal there. And I realize that it does go against the uh, the, the plan, uh, the area plan. Um, and I realize that, that area plan is developed and has a lot of input from the neighborhood. Um, so we presented this to the neighborhood uh, building, you know, design elevations. I have some other additional renderings and things like that that I'm, I'm happy to share with you if, if that's helpful to, to further paint the picture of what we're looking at. But um, the residents in that neighborhood were, were supportive of what we're doing. Um, they were excited to see the quality of the building that we're looking at, um, the quality of the, of the individual units, you know, at 900 square feet, two bed, two bath, 
with with laundry facilities inside each unit. Um, there was a lot of praise from from the community to be able to provide these type of, of uh, apartments within this within this area. Um, I'll speak briefly to the to the parking issue. Um, to be honest, until just yesterday, or, uh, or I guess it was actually on Friday, we got the the planning commission notes. We didn't realize that the allowance to reduce the number of parking lots based on low income housing was was only allowed if you had at least 10 units. Um, so we didn't realize that we were even asking for a variance in that in that realm. Um, we could go back and look at uh, could we get two more spaces in the, in the back of the, of the building um, or if there's other options that wasn't something that we were knowingly non compliant with. So that's something we could review as well. Um, Travis, if you want to present your PowerPoint, um, I got that shared and you can just tell me when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Shu. Uh, so yeah, basically what we're looking at now is just the current on the left and what we're proposing on the right. Um, so yeah, to the point, the massing is pretty similar. The, the context or the, the building is contextual of the rest of the neighborhood on the east side of, of Benton. Um, and while it is like like was said earlier, a little bit taller, it's not, you know, we're not putting a high rise here, right? It still fits within the overall massing of the street. Um, you want the next next slide? Um, it's gonna kind of lays out the, the previous um, kind of how we got to this point. I think I I I went through most of these um, steps earlier just in, in what we talked about. Um, the the ownership group had originally applied applied this project for the CCED funding. Um, they were not ultimately approved for that. So a lot of this stuff is from the CCED process as well. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, again, just showing the, the dilapidated state of the existing building, uh, just you know, further showing that it's really not an option to, to restore this building. Next slide. Um, and then this is kind of different renderings of different, aside from just the elevation. So we have a partial brick facade that turns the corner there towards the north. Um, we're going to have balconies on the front, balconies on the back, uh, and then looking at just a horizontal, like hardy board siding on the return, the return elevations on the east, west, or the, sorry, the north, south, and west. Um, yeah. Next slide. So really, again, a lot of this was what's put on here to, to further, to, you know, describe to CCED why this was a, an important project to get funded there. But it's also, uh, even though that was not, we were not granted funding from CCD, this is also relevant to what we're trying to do and what the ownership is trying to do. Um, you know, it's a minority owned, um, you know, developer, and this is kind of their, their plan to help provide growth in this area, doing things in a way that's, that's incremental, but also catalytic to, to bring this neighborhood up. Um, I know the spot zoning is a question and I'm not exactly like I'm not a I'm not a planner, so I'm not exactly sure how that's viewed in different ways that's viewed. But there are just in this specific uh, micro area of the site, um, you know, the, the property of the north is available, or sorry, it's not available, but it is it is vacant, so it could be it could be built out. There's four other sites right here at this at this area of of the you know really almost adjacent to this property. Um, that are land bank owned sites. And there would be a goal, you know, I mean, I don't want to speak for the ownership group, but you know, it's it's conceivable that these other sites would be additional properties that we would look at developing in a similar way. So really trying to provide, um, while it is a little bit more dense overall, it's, it's contextual to this deal and tr trying to provide, you know, affordable housing in an area that, that you know, frankly just, just needs it and hasn't had very much development, especially not new development in over 20 years, probably. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is our team. The two guys on the left, uh, TJ Jolly and Doug Nemosi, are the main owners. And then the rest of us are supporting their efforts and their vision. I think that's naturally yeah, really it from that standpoint. Thank you. Sure. OK, any questions for the applicant? And Travis, did you mention um, what those 
units are going to be rented at and are you getting tax credits? Uh, I did not mention what they're renting at and frankly I don't know that I know for sure what they are um, and ask the, the ownership and they're not getting tax credits no. Sure, good morning. Uh, thank you for your question. This is Doug Umsey uh, with the ownership group. Uh, the units that we were looking at, uh, I think I can go back and answer one of the earlier questions about affordability. Uh, the plan was to have of the six units, half of it would be affordable. And the other half, so three and three would be for uh, market rates. So overall, our plan was to have the affordable units be rented at an amount of about 850. Uh, given that the building would be about a 12 month uh, period, we could obviously uh, look at that, but we wanted to create um, a level of rental that would, based on uh, the income of the area, be no more than 30 to 33% of, of the median income uh, for residents there. So uh, the market rates would be a little different. It would be north of 950, uh, and that still would be at a modest discount to other areas that we've rented, that we've seen uh, rentals go up for in that area around Benton. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? Uh, this is Commissioner Hill. I don't really have a um, specific question, rather a statement. Um, you know, the um, area plans are important to um, this process because it does speak to the long-term vision. And what I do appreciate about this project is if you're going to modify that, you engage the neighborhood. And it seems that um, as I'm looking through the packet, at least on the August 17th uh, meeting, the project team held a meeting, got input. It was looks to be very favorable for the neighborhood to say that, hey, we think that this project, while not fitting in our, our long range plan, does add value. It increases um, the viability of the neighborhood by taking a dilapidated structure and then providing an opportunity for housing. So while I do appreciate the staff always thinking about the policy recommendations of the neighborhood and making sure their voices are centered, I do think that with this project, there was an attempt to go to the neighborhood to make sure that this was represented of their vision and to bring back a project that speaks to that. So um, I would just encourage us to think about that um, when we start to uh, vote. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo what Ms. Hill said. I think also um, the fact that you're going to get two new ADA accessible units on the ground floor, which is something you don't see a lot in this neighborhood and with an aging population, I'm sure those will go quick. So um, I think that's a really important factor. Um, and I think also the fact that we are staying within the footprint of the existing building and not too far off from the height of, of the existing building matters a lot to me because I think it's really, and when you see those buildings on either side, that made the argument that you're not changing the density dramatically at all. Um, and I think when the area plan is speaking to this lower residential um, use, they could easily be speaking to the houses across the street, which are about the same level of scale when you look at that almost three-story um, shirtwaist houses that are across the street. So. Um, my, my belief is it doesn't really matter what happens inside these structures as long as the structures kind of in size and scale comply. So um, to me, I, I believe it does. And I'm really excited about the idea that this scale of development could occur in these neighborhoods. Okay. Um, if there's no more questions from the commission, let's go ahead and open it up for public testimony. Uh, Joe, has anybody raised their hand to, uh, about this case? No, Mr. Chairman, no one's raised their hand. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close public testimony. Uh, anything else, applicant, you would like to state uh, before we go just to the commission and make a motion? Uh, I just want to thank, say thank you to, sorry, sorry TJ, uh, to your consideration. Um, you know, the staff was great to work with. Shu and I had several emails and phone calls back and forth. And so I just, I just want to thank you all for, for your guys' time today and for Ms. Woods, uh, you know, efforts as well on the project. All right, thank you. Mr. Jolly? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, echo that. Just thank everybody for your time and um, 
just really want to point out the fact that um, it's nothing happening right now on Benton Boulevard. And what we hope to um, start is be that gap developer uh, because this community really needs um, some additional affordable housing. And, um, you know, anything that we do is at the heart of the community. So we definitely try to align with that. And we really want to step in and be that gap developer to get some things uh, going um, on this side of the street. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. All right, so at this time, I'm going to head and close all, all testimony and just leave it for the commission. Uh, Mr. Baker, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just had a few points. I'm in complete support of this project. I think it's what we need. Um, we are in a housing crisis, and if you can build $850 units without tax incentives, like, let's do it. And um, I also lived in a sixplex in a similar situation with a school to my right and single families across the street. Uh, and it was great and it helped me launch myself into home ownership. Um, so I would encourage us to uh, approve this plan because it's a great stepping stone for people and it's respectful to the neighborhood and the, the massing of the, the neighborhood as well. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Uh, unless somebody wants to go ahead and make a motion. Uh, I can make the motion. Can I add 2.1 and 2.2 together? Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, I move uh, docket item 2.1 and 2.2 be uh, approved. Are there any conditions? I was just getting ready to look, uh, I think. Uh, um, staff recommended denial, so there was no condition being placed and plus this is a rezoning without plan and with area plan amendment, there would not be any conditions placed. Okay, so um, I move that docket item 2.1 and 2.2 be approved uh, without conditions. Okay, I've got a motion and a second. I do have a second. So uh, with that, Lisa, do you mind taking roll call, please? Yes, and who gave that second? Uh, Commissioner Sadowski. Sadowski, okay, thank you. Commissioner Allender. Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Crow? Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. Rojas? Aye. And Sadowski? Aye. So it looks like the project has actually been approved, eight to none. Uh, sounds like a great project that the commission fully supports, so we wish you well on it, and maybe we'll see more. So, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yep. All right, Joe. Let's go ahead and move on to case number four. All right. Um, docket item number four is case number SUP twenty twenty zero 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 three one. Request to approve a special use permit in District DC downtown core to allow for a signage plan pursuant to section 88-445-08-L on about three acres located on the south side of 22nd between Campbell on the east and Holmes on the west. Olafu Agbaji is the staff planner. Mr. Olafu. Good are. morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Commission, Olafu Agbaji, City Planning and Development. Um, this next case, can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, just move this. Joe Tindall is the applicant, and I think I saw him on the, on the, uh, on the list. So this next case is located in the Hospital Hill area, just off 71 and East 22nd Street. This is the actual site. So it's currently zoned DC. And this was, a. Uh, it's on the south side of East 22nd Street between Charlotte on the west and Campbell on the east. This is a, this is, this was approved back in 2018. And back then the city council approved what will be to the right here is University Health One, 
This building is University Health too. There was an existing building in the site and that building was demolished to allow for this, what you see here today, which is a four story office building for Truman Medical Center, also called University Health too. That plan approved in 2018 allowed for up to 207,000 square foot, two office towers at this location. And I'll show you the site plan and also allow for what you see the skywalk across East 22nd Street and also under that skywalk across, uh, across Charlotte to go to a parking garage. They also approved a parking garage for about 490 parking spaces. Again, this is what is called UH2, a medical office building for Truman. And UH1 is on the north side of East uh, 22nd Street. This site that currently has surface parking as a site for second building. Building one is about 118,000 square feet for story with a part drive loop here. And then this is the second skywalk. So the only reason and the request before you today is to up, up, approve a special use permit. And the only reason is before you is that they are proposing a temporary burner, which I'll show you in a minute. So they are proposing a temporary banner. When they came through, um, staff wanted some mural or art, um, some kind of art to be a temporary placeholder for this wall until the second tower is built. And what they want to go with is this banner. The banner is 27 by 27, which is about 729 uh, square feet. And that's just a sign that's out of our normal approval criteria. The overall campus has signage for the entire site, including wall signs, monument sign, directional signs, all the signs that meet the sign uh, criteria within the code have been approved and will be approved. The only two signs coming through here today that would then go to uh, the Board of Zoning Adjustment is this banner because it exceeds any sign the staff can approve. So they are applying for a special use permit that's allowed under 884508L for hospital signs. So they're using that criteria. Again, this is the wall that will house the sign. Actually, I think the anchors for the banner is what you see right now, just those four anchors. They are also asking for a variance in the amount of, I think, 2.5 feet to allow this uh, direction, parking direction assigned to be taller, so it's more visible. So those are the two signs that will be going to the Board of Zoning Adjustment for approval. Um, again, they are, this is before you because uh, a signage for train sign necessary to the proper identification of facilities within a hospital may be approved by special use permit. And again, all the signs within the, the campus has been approved. This is just the two signs that they need um, the variance from. Staff's recommendation of this is for approval subject to the five conditions and I'll take any, any questions. Olufu, well, so is the banner sign, is that um, something that would change out regularly? No, um, they request the banner to be there for up to five years or whenever the second tower is constructed, there'll be a tower constructed on this, that's about four story also. So when that tower is constructed, the banner will go away. Staff's recommendation is for one year, and thanks for that question. Staff's recommendation is to have it up for one year, but I also have uh, conditions in my approval that states that if um, staff finds, at any time staff sees that the banner is started or in bad shape, we can request them to change it. So if it goes beyond a year, that's a condition of approval that I put in there. And you can uh, choose to give them more than a year, but staff's recommendation is for a year and depends on when the next hour, the next phase of the development comes in. Any other questions? Any questions? 
Okay, seeing nothing, let's go ahead and welcome the applicant. Mr. Tindall, are you available by chance? I've just promoted him, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Now you're unmuted. Joe? Hello? We can hear you. Okay. All right. Did you have any questions for me? Uh, not necessarily. We're just seeing if you had anything to add to the staff report. Well, the, this, as I understand, this includes the banner. And, uh, and um, I just wanted to clarify one thing that uh, Olafu said. So he one of the commission one of the conditions is the banner could only remain up for one year. Is that correct? Uh, the way it's stated now, the special use permit would be good for one year on the on the banner piece, uh, and you'd have to come back for years okay. after that. And then will we have? To I'm sorry. Okay, so we have to submit. Kind of losing you there, Mr. Tyndall. We would have to submit another request to keep it up for more than a year. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, he, Hello, can you hear requested, me? he requested five years. Staff recommendation is for, um, is for one year. Can you hear year. me, Joe? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Mr. Tyndall. Uh, sorry, Mr. Olafu was talking for a second. His request was for a five-year period. Staff's recommendation is for one year. It's up to the plan commission to figure something in between our between plan commission and BZA. He can see what's medium for him. So. But if it is uh, a five-year period, then if there's a sign of the uh, uh, of the sign being aged or torn or something like that, then the city go and request that it be replaced or removed. I understand that, Joe. I understand that. Um, it's just that it's it's a quite an expensive proposition to put up a banner for one year, given the framing, et cetera, that's have that will have to be built to support it. Okay. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Um, understood. The other, the other. God, thanks, Joe. The other um, um, thing that uh, Olafu brought up about the. Uh, um, we call it a, a, a monument sign that's basically will be used to direct people to the parking garage. Uh, the reason we requested the, uh, the, uh, that it be a taller height, just over two feet higher than what's allowed is because um, we want to have the lettering be large enough so people with um, difficulty seeing or you know, discerning characters will be able to see uh, the sign so they can be directed to the right parking area. Um, if we have to reduce the height of the, the requested sign, it'll reduce some of the type by 40%, which is a pretty significant reduction from a, from a visibility standpoint. Just a curiosity with the additional height of that sign, does that pose a, an obstruction for drivers coming in and out of the garage? No, no, it does not. Okay, any questions from the commission to the applicant? Okay, seeing none, so uh, let's go ahead and open it up for public testimony. Is there anybody from the public that would like to comment about this case? Sorry, I was muted. There's someone named Linda Lighton who's raised their hand. Okay. I promoted her. Hi, Ms. Lighton. As you come off of being muted, do you mind stating your name and address for the record, please? Yeah, this is Linda Lighton at, at 708 East 31st Street in Kansas City, Missouri. I would like to um, wonder why you're not doing a piece of art for that instead of uh, that picture. I think it's something fabulous, and I think. Any artist would be thrilled to be shown in that way. So, 
So you're kind of breaking up on us. I think the question was, is you're wondering why we're not doing any artwork instead of a banner for that particular location? That's correct. So, okay. Uh, Mr. Tyndall, do you mind answering that question? Of course not, Joe. Um, well, I think that that's a good question uh, that she asked. Two reasons. Number one is that, um, you know, we'd like to have obviously some flexibility as far as uh, potentially changing out the banner uh, in the future, which our work would not allow. Also, um, it would be given the, uh, the, the fascia that's on the building, um, it really isn't conducive to, um, you know, using some kind of paint or artwork on the building. So it's really not conducive to that as well. That could still be rented and they, under that kind of conditions that it would be one or five years. Uh, and I just think it would really enhance the neighborhood, enhance uh, the building and enhance the public. And I mean, you could find something that was very uplifting or something that could Things under the conditions. Okay, uh, Miss Leiden, it's really hard to hear and understand what you're saying. I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me better now. A little bit, but not much. Let me see if I can. Um, okay. Hear me better now. That's great. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering if you had. It could be printed. There's not a problem with that, the same as you're printing this. And it could be under condition of one to five years, whatever your plan is. And I just think it would enhance the building so much more and add so much to the community if you had a piece of art there. It doesn't have to be a permanent piece of art, a printed piece of art. Yeah, I understand your comment. I think also that the, uh, they want something that ties into the um, the nature of the hospital in terms of the services that they provide. Um, so I think that's part of it also. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody else that's raised their hand, Joe, by chance? Muted again, sorry. Um, no, no one else has raised their hand. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and close public testimony at this time. And if Sounds like it already we've got comment back from the applicant uh, based on the public testimony. Um, are there any other questions from the commission to the applicant? Uh, I have a question for um, Ogle Food. I just, I'm just curious as to, um, Tyndall raised the question about having the permit for I think the uh, parking signage for one year. Is there, um, if we were to increase it to two years, versus just this one year, would that change it significantly? Just, I'm just curious. I don't think it would change it. Um, let's separate the signs. The banner is what gets the special use permit and the time limit. The other request, which is gonna to go to the BZA is for variance to the height. So okay. the BZA will determine if they will grant that variance or not. So they want the, the height to be taller. But for the banner, which is the special use permit, the only reason staff wanted a year was just the fear of it being tattered or just okay. getting run down. But I have a condition that staff has the authority to go in and tell them to change it if you guys grant it more than a year. So you, you have the flexibility to grant it a year, two, three, or even up to the five that they want, but we will get a call if it started or if any one of you see it, either just give us a call and we'll let the uh, Truman Medical Center know to replace it. So the other thing is that also there's going to be another tower. There's another building coming that's going to be about four story also that's going to cover this wall. Okay. So in lieu of doing any art is just this is a temporary banner to hold it till that project goes so we hope that the hospital does well and they want to build and they may build in a year or they may build in five years so we hope probably a year or two rather than five years thank you i was just curious as whatever the pleasure of the commission i don't have a strong position on either of it i just heard it as a concern also what will happen is Sorry, sorry. No, sir. go ahead. Go ahead. Over. What will happen is we will then review the facade of that east wall 
better than what we have now. So this wall that you see, it's a wall that's going to be, you know, it's an internal wall to the building. So the wall, the facade of that building will be completely different from what you see. I was going to also say that in addition to managing the tatteredness or durability is the color fat fastness of the photo because on the east facade over the course of five years, that would be my probably main concern. Um, and then maybe to just echo Ms. Lighton's statement, I, I feel like there's probably a way to make it both advertise the services that the hospital is offering without it feel like feeling like an advertisement, which is kind of what it feels like now, so that it can actually be something that has a sense of beauty to it for all the neighbors that are looking at it as they drive by. Um, but that's more just color commentary to this. Um, I'm fine with the idea of it lasting for, for five years. That makes it a lot easier in terms of their construction schedule. Um, but I, I just would want to make sure that the color is maintained. Uh, Joe, just or Olafu, just a question. Uh, one of the conditions is that they need to receive approval from the Municipal Arts Commission. Is that is that for the sign that goes to the parking garage? Or is that also for the banner that they're getting approval nope. on that? That will be for the sign that's on the. I'll show you that the sign that's on the skywalk, which is okay. over, the, yeah, I got over the public. And they have received that, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, you have that approval? Um, yes, that is correct. We have the yeah, approval. So, they, so that has been granted by Municipal Arts Commission and all he has to do now is file for the sign permit and we will release that sign permit for them to install. And I will show you that real quick, if you don't mind. Yeah, I... So it's for the sign that's over the public right away on the skywalk, which is over East 22nd Street. So where am I? This is Commissioner Enders. Uh, I'm supportive of not restricting it to one year. I think that uh, I, I like the um, allowing us to, you know, look at it and have staff see if it, if it wears over time. But otherwise I think that for all parties involved, it saves people time to just go ahead and approve it for five years. Oh, for, it's uh, Commissioner Allender. Is that the only concern? It's just the tattering of the sign that you restricted back from five down to one? Or were there other concerns? Um, mostly just the, uh, like uh, Commissioner Sadowski said, it's going to fade being on the east wall because you will get the full UV uh, sunrise to past noon. So I may change the language if you don't mind, if you can amend the language. My language, my condition number four states that the banner shall be maintained in pristine condition at all time and must be taken down if it begins to show signs of distress as determined by staff. So if that, I think that also covers uh, fading. So if, if we feel it's fading, we can uh, let them know too. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, anything else? Uh, I will entertain a motion, please. Uh, this is Commissioner Enders. Move to approve docket item number four um, with conditions, but removing the condition um, that limits this approval to one year. Okay. And put it up to five years? Yes, please. Okay, so I've got a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, so I have a motion from Commissioner Enders and a second from Commissioner Sadowski. And I believe Commissioner Beasley is going to recuse herself from this one? Yes, I was going to wait till Lisa called me, but yes, I'm recusing myself from this one. Okay. So Lisa, do you mind taking roll call, please? I was making a note of that. Okay. Um, Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Corral? Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? 
Aye. Rojas? Aye. And Sadowski? Aye. Okay, so it looks like the motion passes uh, seven to zero. Um, so good luck with the project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, much. so Joe, moving right along here, we've got Dr. Allen 5-1, 5-2, and 5-3. Nice. Uh, and on this, we do have a required uh, quorum. So just making sure we note that as well. That's right. You have a required quorum on 5.2 because you did previously hear that case and 5.3. Um, 5.1 is a new case that you guys asked them to file last time you heard it. So I'll start with that. 5.1 is case number CPC 2020-00139. Request your approval amendment to the Swope area plan to change the recommended land use from medium high residential to commercial for an area of about 0.65 acres located at 5005 Swope Parkway. Docket item C 5.2, case number CPC 2019-00141. Request to approve a rezoning from District R2.5 to B2-1 in order to allow for the continued operation of a tire shop on about 0.65 acres at 5005 Slope Parkway. And docket item 5.3, case number SUP 2020-00007. Request to approve a special use permit at the same location for the proposed or for the tire shop use. Patty Knowles presenting the case today. Good morning. This is Patty Knowles, City Planning and Development Department staff. I am taking this case over temporarily for fellow planner Jamie Hicks. The project is the 5005 Swamp Parkway Auto Shop. And I will share my screen. Um, and proceed to the PowerPoint presentation. I believe Jamie presented the report on this uh, the last time this was heard on June 16th. So you may be familiar with most of this. The property is located at Onswap Parkway. It is a former fire station. Surrounding land uses include undeveloped property immediately to the north, to the south, and to the east are located uh, multifamily uh, residential properties, which are owned by the Housing Authority of Kansas City. Across Swope Parkway to the east is the former Satchel Page Memorial Stadium. It happens to be zoned B3. Uh, other property in the area uh, is, is all residential, residentially zoned. And the property to the north is also owned by the city of Kansas City, Missouri. This uh, former fire station was sold to the applicant in roughly 2012, according to information provided by the applicant's architect. The applicant was cited for operating an automotive repair shop on the property. The property itself is zoned R-2.5, a district which is residential and does permit public and civic uses. This fire station was permitted at the time the zoning, however, does not permit the current use of the property as an auto body shop. The applicant has received a notice for violation for operating this use and seeks approval to rezone the property to make the current use legal. The applicant has recently, um, as of August 25th, as Joe stated, filed the area plan amendment to change the recommended land use from residential medium high to commercial. And then a special use permit is required for automobile repair uses when they are on, are on property adjacent to and within 150 feet of a parkway as this property does happen to be adjacent to Swope Parkway. So therefore the special use permit is also requested. Uh, just a little bit of history is that the owner has been operating this um, shop a notice of violation was sent on October 26th of 2018, roughly two years ago. Uh, since shortly after that date, various staff uh, signed to the case have had numerous conversations and shared correspondence with the applicant's architect, Larry Goldblatt, regarding the need to file various applications for rezoning, special use permit, area plan amendment, and the stream buffer plan. The application rezone was filed in August of 2019. Um, 
about uh, 10 months after the original notice of violation was sent. Applicant filed the application to re for special use permit in February of 2020. And then the applicant recently filed the area plan amendment. Initially, the applicant did not complete the public engagement requirements. Uh, so the cases were not docketed. Um, however, because the owner was operating in violation and there was a case pending in municipal court, staff determined that the cases should be docketed and placed on the agenda for hearing by city planning commission. And that was uh, the hearing on June 16th. As stated, after that, the applicant filed the area plan amendment. Uh, additionally, the applicant was instructed to file the stream buffer plan. The applicant did submit a letter on August 25th stating the reasons that the stream buffer was not applicable to this property. Uh, a plan has not yet been submitted. A letter has been uh, submitted to the land development division. Applicant requests a waiver of the conditions regarding the need to submit a stream buffer plan. The area plan of record is the Swilt Park area plan. That plan was adopted in 2014, recommending residential medium high. That category would permit small lots, single family development, townhomes, two unit houses, and multi unit houses up to eight units, um, or three to eight units, up to 17.4 units per acre. The land use classification corresponds with the R2.5 zoning category, which is uh, placed on the site. The proposed rezoning, as stated, does not conform to the recommendation of the area plan amendments. The um, case, recent relevant cases, do involve the zoning violation, which was uh, opened on September 7th, 2018, and of for which notice was sent on October 26th. That case is currently pending before the municipal court awaiting city planning commission and city council disposition of these cases. The property is just over an acre in size located within an area with uh, institutional civic and residential uses. The building on the site has been used for the fire station. Um, and as you can see, it's currently operated um, being used for an auto repair uh, service. The zoning enforcement officer who reviewed the, the, the case suspects that auto, general automotive repair is occurring on the site rather than limited auto repair. Uh, general uh, auto repair would not be allowed under the B2 zoning. That would require B3 zoning. However, the applicant has filed for the B2 zoning. So the if uh, zoning is granted in this case, the applicant would be limited to uses under the category of limited auto repair. The um, prop, uh, staff then uh, is, uh, considers not only the uh, rezoning in this case, but the area plan amendment, the rezoning and the special use permit. Um, to summarize, the area plan amendment recommends medium high density residential, applicant requests commercial, the applicant requests rezoning from R2.5 to B2-1 to allow the use and the special use permit is required because the property is adjacent to the parkway. The, just to uh, briefly summarize the process, area plan amendment is reviewed by uh, staff, city plan commission, and then city council. The rezoning process is the same. Special use permit is first reviewed by staff then receives a recommendation from city plan commission to the board of zoning adjustment. And that um, then board of zoning adjustment has the final disposition. This is a summary of the various dates at which I have uh, stated these uh, different submittals occurred, different meetings. Uh, Jamie presented quite a bit of information to you previously about correspondence letters that were sent so there has been significant involvement by staff with the applicant attorney, or I'm sorry, architect in this case. So that brings us to the analysis. The proposed land use is limited automotive repair. Future land use recommends medium residential high. The rezoning uh, finds that the land is across the street to the, uh, from property that is owned B3-2 
However, that former Satchel Page Memorial Stadium is owned by the city and has been used for years as recreational and open space. The character of the area is residential and recreational open space in nature, uh, given the uh, surrounding land used to the, to the um, east and south being multifamily residential. The re staff is concerned that the requested zoning of B2 would permit more intense commercial uses, uses which would result in increased traffic noise. And um, B2 does allow auto, limited auto repair, but not general auto repairs, I noted, uh, which is likely what this operation actually is. Staff is concerned that either under the current or proposed zoning, outdoor storage is not permitted, but is occurring, which is uh, the reason for the original citation in part. It is not clear how this applicant will operate, even if zoning is granted, without storing tires, parts, disabled vehicles, and such outdoors. It appears that the building is fairly small and would not accommodate indoor storage. In review of the special use permit, the um, proposed use of the auto repair, regardless of whether it's limited or general, would have a significant adverse impact on the area and the community in terms of the noise, the aesthetics, the other characteristics of an auto repair facility in general. The surrounding land use, as I stated, is residential recreational open space. Auto repair is not found to be a compatible use because they do generate significant noise, traffic generation, um, aesthetic qualities that are not compatible with residential areas and along the parkway. In uh, analyzing the cases, staff refers to a citation from 8832301 from the Boulevard and Parkway Standards section of the Zoning and Development Code. And I will read that. Considerable public and private investment exists and ex is expected to occur adjacent to boulevards and parkways within the city. The following standards are intended to promote quality development reflective of the character of the city's boulevard and parkway system when on an established historic boulevard or on a parkway traversing undeveloped areas of the city. So this uh, provides justification to the city to carefully consider whether this auto repair shop is appropriate and compatible given the character of the area as it exists and then along the boulevard or parkway, which in this case would be Swope Parkway. So staff analysis concludes that the auto repair is not a compatible and appropriate land use at this location. Staff therefore recommends denial of the cases, the request to amend the Swope area plan, the request to rezone, and the request for special use permit. However, should the City Planning Commission vote to recommend approval, staff recommends that the conditions as stated within the staff report be attached to the cases regarding rezoning and special use permit. And I note again that the applicant has requested a waiver of condition five and presumably condition number six, although he hasn't stated such, requiring the preliminary stream buffer plan. And this concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a quick question I have, and that's, uh, so they're looking at zoning to the B2-1, uh, even though that may not be what they're doing on this site, and you mentioned that a B3 would be better. Is that, has that application been filed or, or is it not? No, no, it has not. Okay. Okay. So it would stick with the B2-1 if it were to move forward. Yes. Okay. Are there any questions from the rest of the commission uh, for Ms. Knoll? So, so there were questions about the public engagement. Um, did you guys get any details about that? Um, yeah, beyond? I did. And I attached to the staff report, the applicant's submittal regarding public engagement. The um, there is no neighborhood or civic organization, as I stated, registered in this area. So um, Mr. Goldblatt states that the business owner met, I'm quoting, reading this verbatim, met people one-on-one -on -one or through neighbors helping. High percentage of residents lack internet access or are computer literate. This method supersedes digital for this reason. Um, due to COVID-19, due to deficient access, to means of electronic communications in this community, signed petitions were used as alternative to public meetings. 
Neighborhood Association did not respond to requests. So the applicant has provided um, a page with a few signatures, I presumably uh, customers of the auto shop. The applicant has also provided uh, attached to the staff report the uh, his letter regarding the string buffer requirements. And I will allow him to present that. I could put that up on the screen if you so desire. Uh, so, um, so staff did determine that the public engagement requirement had been met. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and welcome the applicant. So applicant, as you are coming off of mute, do you mind stating your name and address for the record, please? And then Patty, if you don't mind, if we could see, there we go, thank you. Hi, Larry, we're not able to hear you yet. I know you've been promoted and, and right now it looks like you're on mute. Yeah. Hi, Larry, there. I... I had unmuted him and now he now he's unmuted again. Larry, can you please speak? Don't wait for me. So Larry, if you remember at the beginning of our meeting, if you could go ahead and get started. Uh, we're kind of on a time crunch here. Mr. Chairman, can I be excused for about three minutes, four minutes? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Rojas. Thank you. Still can't hear you, Larry. Larry, can you hear us? Can you try calling in from the phone? You might ask him to send you a message in the chat. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I asked him to try to call in from the phone through chat. I'm not sure if he can hear us. Um, he is responding there, so I'm going to send him the information. Okay. Yeah, if there's still going to be a technical difficulty, then I would suggest we move on to the next case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm back. All right. Thank you. It's nice to see you now. Okay, I'm here. Uh, can um, 
Nicole, I'm going to go ahead and ask, since I have to run this on Zoom, if you can help get help Patty get Larry the call-in information. Please. Yeah, and if you don't mind, Joe, let's go ahead and hold uh, 5.1, 2, and 3 and move on to case 7 and come back to that one while they work out their technical difficulty. Okay, that Joe. Works. Okay. All right, docket item seven is case number CPC 2020-00097, a request to approve an amendment to a previously approved development plan in District R0.5 to allow for residential uses on about six acres located at the northeast corner of East 86th Street and Hillcrest Road. Olufu Baji is a staff planner. Okay. Joe, just to be, be careful, we might want to make sure we de-promote uh, Larry and then come back to him after this case? Will do. All right, thank you. Mr. Hey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This next case is located in the southern part of the city where my arrow is pointing to. Okay. And it's uh, right uh, on the north side of East 87th Street and the west side of 435, just south of Hillcrest Golf Course. Address of the site is 8507 um, Hillcrest Road. So this is just uh, uh, west of, east of what will be Oxford on the blue. Uh, Foley equipment is south of the site and Cerner, uh, campus will be just to the southeast of the site. Um, the request before you, and this is a unique case, is a request to amend about uh, six acres. The six acres you see currently zoned R0.5. And um, this is uh, one of a unique plan from over the old zoning code, which was chapter 80. This had a limited district plan, and what the limited district plan does is it limits it to what's on that plan. And so it was more of an old contract zoning. So the request before you today is to amend the plan within the six acre area that's bounded on the south by East 86th Street on the, way, uh, and, uh, on the east side of Hillcrest and then just uh, west of our I-435. This is the Boilermakers Union. So back in 1987, um, the city council approved a plan that allowed for three office building in three phases um, on this, as part of this plan. And the plan allowed for 143,000 square feet of office building with about 424 parking spaces. The unique thing about this is back in chapter 80, we had what was referred to as residential office district, and this was a limited district. So the existing office within this phase, which is considered phase two has been constructed, which makes the plan vested. That's why we have to amend the plan. Uh, phase three, which is the subject of this amendment allowed for a six story office building which is about 70,000 square feet building with 208 parking spaces. So the request the developer is asking you today is proposing to amend the previously approved plan to allow for residential use within part of phase three. And the reason I say part of phase three, again, this is the approved plan. This is the plan approved in 1987. So of this plan, phase two is currently existing Phase one has not been built and this is phase three. So if you look at phase three closely, there's a six story building with parking and overall additional uh, land to the north. What makes this unique is that there are multiple uh, owners on this phase three. So we should have, uh, I think, the single family, existing single family to the north is owned by Mr. Andrew cover and the developer owns this other two parcels. So there's uh, within phase three, there's three, there's actually five parcels of which the developer owns three and then Mr. Cover owns two. 
this is what the concept of the amendment to the plan looks like. So they are proposing to keep the existing single family home and build two um, unit, two, uh, I think 48 unit apartment in this area. And they also shows the ability for Mr. Cover to further develop his parcel as we move forward. This is what their proposed plan looked like for their portion of their holdings of phase three. We do have an application on file that's on hold subject to uh, the recommendation or the action by on this plan to see if it's amended or not. The uniqueness of this plan and I'll explain to you in a minute. So this is the site highlighted in yellow, which includes this parcel of their holding. It's about three acres. They would like, part of the requirement is that they extend sewer from where this lower arrow is. But this parcel, phase three, currently does not have sewer. So that will require extension of sewer from where my arrow is up to, the, to serve this lot. As part of the amendment, staff recommended that they make sure, as required by every development and every developer, provide sewer all the way to the limits of their plot. As this uh, graphic shows, the red line shows where the ridge is. So this parcel, the reason the original plan only had the building on this area and parking and detention facility on the northern part is that everything north of this red line drains northward and will be served by this sewer line that's located about 720 feet from this parcel. So what that does is that even the current approved plan, this is the current approved plan, realized and based on the engineering, figured out that there could be no building here because it could not be served without the extension of sewer from the north. So that means even if this applicant amending this plan wants to extend sewer to serve this, they cannot do that because the sewer does not flow back this way by gravity flows out. I do have additional, uh, the applicant did provide some uh, graphics that they will share with you if you want to. So staff's recommendation of this is for approval subject to the 23 conditions. And with that, I'll take any questions. Is there a requirement? I was looking through the conditions. I didn't necessarily see it. Is there a requirement for sidewalks? Uh, yes. OK. The plan shows sidewalks. So if it's not required, it's because it's on the plan. Okay, any other questions from the commission uh, for this project? So all through just to, just to make sure I understand, uh, the sewer is going to be extended from the south going north to serve this particular project? That's correct. And they're hoping that they can just stop it there and not extend on the north side, is that correct? And the reason based on, oh, I, I can put the graphic back, the north, northern part or half of the lot drains to the north. Right, okay. And the nearest manhole is about 720 feet to the north of the site. Okay. Um, I just wanna make sure I understand. So the plan, the amendment that has been superimposed on the original plan from the 80s is that correct or Olafu, were you saying that there was some of that that was not going to occur because of the sewer condition? In terms of, let me share number, it again. So the buildings, there's a proposed two story, proposed three story, another proposed three story, and then a small one story. So all, all of those buildings as they're cited would be correct. 
or is it this, you have this, this is what version? the schematics they produce this plan to show that the other part of phase three which they are proposing as phase four can be developed in future for this development to occur the sewer has to be extended from the north for the building that's on the northeast they can drain the two buildings that they're proposing on their lot to the south. And that was one of, that's a sticking point that we have. So, but we require them to extend sewer to at least touch uh, Mr. Cover, which is the existing single family home, to at least touch him and serve him with sewer. But that does not drain down to this basin. So they are separate basins. So the, the, on your or next the, slide, you just show phase three, which is the three buildings that we are approving or are we approving? You just all approve all an amendment to allow for residential versus office and okay. then potential future in this location. So the plan specifies a six story office and the request today is to change it from office to residential. Okay, got it. But what we wanted to do was if we amended the plan, we wanted to make sure that this parcel that's part of phase three, which will now become phase four, can be developed. But well, what, when staff discuss this further, the current existing single family home is on septic and any development or call, let's assume that this developer or this owner comes in today and wants to develop his lot. He cannot drain south. He has to extend that today. So if he came in before this developer and wanted to develop today, he has to extend that sewer regardless. So this developer, is if he was able to extend the sewer south, he would have done that, but extending that sewer to serve him will not help him. So the plan amendment can move forward because he cannot be served by the sewer through this development. I hope that explains it a little better. I think so. I, I guess what I'm hearing is that it's more about the use. It's not so much about where the build, this is in a, a situation where we're approving exactly where the buildings are located and all of that. No, yeah, it's more about the yeah. use because the zoning is R0.5, but the current plan shows an office building. So today's action is to amend the plan to, instead of building an office over this entire piece for uh, this entire piece, will be building, let me go, sorry, over this entire, phase three, we'll be splitting it into phase three and four, and then we'll build residential here and then potential future office or residential at which point they will have to connect to the sewer to the north. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Uh, seeing none, let's go ahead and introduce the applicant. So African, as you come online, if you don't mind, please say your name and address for the record. Yeah, my name's Kurt Yoder. Um, I work, for, I'm a civil engineer with BHC Roads. Our address is 7101 College Boulevard in Overland Park. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to add to uh, Olafu's staff report and presentation? Um, yeah, a little bit, uh, not much, but let me, I'll just, so you can follow along with what I'm saying. I'll share my screen. Okay, you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so we're proposing to amend this development plan that was approved back over 30 years ago. We don't want to do anything with this southern portion or the existing um, building that got developed from this existing development plan. All we want to do is develop this L-shaped property and we're proposing to put two different apartment buildings on it. Total would be 48 units, which is within the allowable existing zoning um, for this area. Um, we, our developer has no intentions to develop this property. We are merely just showing that this area, uh, this property could be developed um, by, um, by us amending this development plan. So I just want to clear that up. Our intentions are only to develop 
this area of the property and that would require a sanitary sewer ex main extension from the south um, and this for this property it would require sanitary sewer main extension from the north um, since it's so so much lower than our property um, just to say a little bit about the project it, we're proposing to put apartment units on the project to serve um, housing so shortage in the area we, we the owner the developer thinks that there will be a uh, high demand for housing in this area i think primarily due to the cerner development in this area so we're trying to fill that need any questions yeah i, I do have a question so as part of your project you're going to uh demolish the south south house there correct uh, we are not proposing to demolish the house on our property we're proposing to basically use that as a leasing office. Okay, and it will be connected to the sanitary sewer system? That, that, that house, yeah, we, we would have to convert that to, so th this would be the main, the manhole for the main extension and we would have to um, connect all the proposed building in that existing house to the, okay. to that main system. And then I'm just curious, the house to the north of that that will also remain, um, that there's not any proposed development. Is there a possibility if they decide to put in a grinder pump or something similar, that they can have an easement to tap into the sanitary sewer as well? Yeah, we proposed that option. Um, and it sounded like city staff does not support um, allowing an easement for a service line going across our property. Okay. Is that correct, Olafu? That's correct. And uh, Stacy Lowe can chime in. She's on, so I think. This is Stacy Lowe, Division Manager of Land Development. The Water Services Department does not allow a private service line to cross a secondary parcel. So they would not allow that configuration. It would have to be a public main that they were accessing directly on their parcel. And I, I can show an exhibit. So th this is an exhibit um, showing a potential sanitary main uh, Hillcrest Road. So we're looking west. This is the existing office building. This would be an extension to our southwest corner of our property. And then if we were to propose an extension to Mr. Corver's property, which is the northern single family home, um, a profile of that sanitary main at the minimum allowable slope, um, it, it, it would basically be at grade at his property line. So it wouldn't, the main extension would have to be from the north. This is Commissioner Enders. Can, can you explain a little bit uh, or just go over again, Mr. Corver's property is, is someone, is he living in that property? Is someone living there? What's the intent of it? No, uh, Mr. Corver uh, lives in Oregon. He rents out the property. I don't know if he's currently renting it out, but that, that's his intent with the property. Um, and m most people in the area to the north of us anyway, that are all residential areas, everyone that either called us, um, or showed up at our neighborhood meeting, um, they were similar, they're absentee owners, they bring out their places. So I, I don't, I think Mr. Corver's, uh, to speak for him, his intent is to rent it out. He has no plans to develop it. As far as, as he far said as he was good he said he was going to be at this meeting so i don't see him though. okay any other questions for the applicant uh yes it's commissioner allender can you talk a little bit about what you're envisioning with regards to affordable housing on your on your uh, two buildings uh maybe the owner greg could chime in but i i don't believe uh the owner developer has any intentions to provide for affordable housing. My understanding is that it would just be market rate, but I'm not completely sure on that. This is Greg Salyers. I don't know if you can hear me. I raised my hand. Yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, in terms, you know, we would consider this workforce housing. We don't propose, we are not proposing an affordable component. We do own in the area and 
we would consider this workforce housing along with some of our other properties uh, where we would consider it affordable for the workforce, but it would not have any restrictions. Okay. And just to clarify by workforce, are you talking about Cerner? Because that was, I'm trying to get a sense of who the demographic is. Cerner would be part of the demographic, yes. And we have uh, the Oxford Blue or the Glade and several uh, newer industrial and high-end imaging uh, buildings that are going up. <clears throat> and that would be the tenant profile we would be looking at. Yeah, the other development to the southwest of the site is a, a Three Trails Commerce Center. It is done by North Point, so that's just to our west of all the uh, equipment. Okay, any other questions from the commission to the applicant? So if not, let's go ahead and open it up for public testimony. Joe, has anybody raised their hand to speak about this particular project? No, Mr. Chairman, no one's raised their hand. Okay, well, let's go ahead and close public testimony. Uh, applicant, anything else to add uh, before we talk, talk amongst the commission? Uh, no, um, we're excited about the project and we have no issues with the staff conditions. Okay. Uh, so commission, if there's a discussion, we can have that. Otherwise I'll entertain a motion. A motion to approve uh, case number seven um, with conditions. Okay, so I've got a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All right, so I've got a motion from uh, Commissioner Baker and a second from Commissioner Sadowski. Lisa, do you mind taking roll call, please? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Crow? Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? All Commissioner Hill? I, sorry, I was on mute. Real sad. Thank you. Yeah. Um, where am I? Commissioner Rojas? Aye. And Commissioner Sadowski? Aye. Okay, so it looks like the project has passed eight to, eight to none, and uh, we wish you well with your project. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, so, Joe, uh, do we need to go back to case docket item five? I think I saw a chat that maybe uh, Larry has uh, maybe not called in yet. Well, we sent him the information and it looks like someone has called in from the 913 area code. So that could possibly be him. Uh, okay. I'm gonna unmute that person just to make sure. Larry, are you on? Yes. Is that you, Larry? Larry Smith. Oh, okay. Wrong I'm Different I'm still, I'm still trying to get through the phone numbers that were provided. I'm sorry. Is this Larry Goldblatt or is this a different? I'm Larry Goldblatt. Okay. Well, we can hear you. Very good. Okay, so the staff has given its report. <clears throat> One second, Mr. Goldblatt, please. So I just want to go back here. So we're now back on to docket items 5.1 and 5.2 and 5.3 uh, with respect to address uh, there's Swope Parkway and East 51st Street talking about the previously uh, fire station and it's been being used as a an automotive shop and uh, so up to this point we've had the 
uh, staff report and and that. So now we're opening up for the actual applicant, which I believe is uh, Larry Goldblatt, to uh, provide his testimony on here. And uh, please again understand, Mr. Goldblatt, we've we uh, you know twenty minute time frame here. We're trying to hit. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, especially to the staff. The uh, first item that we would like to discuss uh, is crucial to the hearing. The, the um, citation and all testimony to this point asserts that Mr. Smith is operating automotive repair, which is a B3-2 use. The reason that the staff recommended that we go to B2.1 is because the evidence is only supportive that it's tire sales, tire repairs, and limited automotive. So every reference written or otherwise made to the higher intense use is inaccurate. Assuming that we all agree informally until the record can be corrected that the actual evidence, not the speculation, uh, we, we don't believe that going forward, the staff's speculation will qualify the city planning commission to vote on. Uh, going forward, we are asking for the B3 uh, dash two because the staff recommended that and it conforms with the evidence. Under the uh, stream buffer requirements, there was no pre development meeting held. And had there been a pre development meeting, uh, we would have found that the property is exempt from the uh, FEMA and the local ordinances. And uh, I'm trying to find that reference, section 88415-07-D. The buffer plan is referenced in the compass filed letter which is not posted on Compass, nor are any uh, review comments. So this site plan exhibit made at the first filing for rezoning was made a part of the submittal by reference. So we have submitted the plan. The substantial improvement test, whether uh, Chapter 28 the floodplain development permit is required is defined as over 50% of the building market value. That limit will not be approached with this approval. The lowest level of the building is an unexcavated crawl space surrounded by a windowless, doorless, poured concrete foundation. The occupied floor level is about elevation 798 which is above the level of the adjacent floodplain. So uh, on the request from the Public Works Department Land Development, uh, we believe that the requirement uh, is not uh, required. Therefore, when the Planning Commission votes, um, <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know how you can vote on something that's exempt. Um, we certainly intend, as we've said from the beginning, that the any uh, adjustments to the landscape are maintenance and repair only, and that's not covered by this ordinance. Uh, we would ask the Planning Commission to acknowledge that the uh, uh, evidence we've submitted is that this uh, particular requirement 
uh, doesn't meet the test of being a requirement. So the staff's recommendation uh, would be uh, uh, denied. Right. Okay. On the uh, area plan amendment, and we have filed the evidence, compliance evidence for section 88415. This is filed with the city. And as of this date, there's no response from the city. Uh, one of the facts of the processing, and the reason the staff recites that their efforts at communication have been multiple is that questions asked by the applicant aren't when not answered. We have to ask the question again or ask it in a different form. Uh, for example, at the beginning of the process, we asked the planners for the name of the staff planner who we would be working with for the Section 88 415 stream buffer. And city development said they didn't know they would get back to us. The, they didn't. Uh, so our, we're in pursuit of completing an application, which we're not provided answers. So when one wants to understand the two hour, oh, sorry, the two year uh, timetable, uh, that's the primary answer for why this has taken so long. In Introducing an evidence in support of the approval of the rezoning from the 2.5 to the 2.1. And this applies to the other applications we've made. The uh, applicant's request is based on the uh, various facts which are in the record. In the June 16th meeting, there was a closed session called for. Uh, we believe the evidence shows that that was improperly uh, permitted, requested. And because of that, there is uh, a question raised by the process, which may affect the city planning commission's thinking uh, Mr. Mr. Goldblatt, uh, let's move it on here. There's, I'm having some issue kind of following along with what you're stating because if all that stuff was actually submitted or provided, it would be sent to us to take an actual look at. And and I, I frankly don't have or see any of that stuff. Um, so we're, we're here today to look at a couple of things. You know, the first one being uh, approve uh, the amendment to the area plan. Haven't, haven't seen anything on that. Um, we're also looking at the rezoning and a special use permit. Um, you stated a B3 is what you're looking for, but you've actually applied for a B2-1. Um, if you want the B3, we, we should have had, had that. Um, so I'm having a little trouble, you know, what's going on here and getting this information. And, and again, we're on a Kind of a time limit here. If I can't, you know, if I can't, we can't get the information we need to help you out. Then it's going to be hard to help you out. Uh, this is exactly what we've gotten throughout the process. So, yeah, I, I would rather have a working kind of relationship here instead of one that you're we're, you're you're, we're you're having a lot of animosity towards staff. It, it feels like, and I, I I'm not going to stand for that. I just want to. Let's talk about the project here and what we can do. The R2.5 to the B2.1 comes from the staff. And since the beginning, no one has discussed B3. Oh. It's just not to be brought up. And okay, so you're rezoning to the B2.1 is what you want to do, period. 
uh, the answer is yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I was going to take in order uh, the testimony, the evidence. So uh, the rezoning is the central motion. The other motions are ancillary and cognizant of time. The uh, we understand that there is no appeal process from administrative decisions. The BZA is not uh, an uh, eligible at appeal board. So the initial event, uh, Mr. Smith was uh, not by his own decision removed from his former location. Uh, we approached the city with the hope that we could discuss a temporary solution which would lead to the full remodeling of this building according to zoning and the city would cooperate with us in getting the zoning for the uh, site that Larry hopes would work. Uh, that was rejected. So we proceeded with the procedure. The city sold the property without stipulations. Informally, the city said, without going to the city planning commission, you will not get your rezoning. Uh, Mr. Smith made clear in his bid documents how he intended to use the property. During the process, we confirmed that uh, Mr. Smith was willing to build a residence with storage and uh, that would conform to the current zoning. However, the staff did not uh, want to discuss that. Uh, there are other matters we'll introduce in writing uh, because of time, and we ask that the City Planning Commission uh, vote to hold this or continue this without fee uh, because there's a limited time but two years' worth of evidence. Uh, we also note that the city didn't disclose at the sale that it intended to vacate the former street. Uh, that ha has a consequence on the usefulness of the property. Excuse me, excuse me, sorry to interrupt. Chair Crow, I have a, a question, a process question, because I'm sure. here from the applicant a request to continue. Um, and so I'm wondering if that is something that, you know, just wanting to know, Process-wise, um, it seems that there's, there's a lot of information. I have remembered this case since June being continued and continued and continued. So I know that there's been ample time <laughs> to provide um, staff, you know, all of these things that the applicant is suggesting. But right now, right. in the interest of the other dockets on the case, I'm just wondering, would it be feasible to offer one more continuance? Mm -mm. All right, or we can vote to deny it. I mean, I guess I can't vote, but. Um, well, it's it's obviously it's up to the commission what they want to do, whether we want to continue with the case or we want to continue it to a different different date. But there's been obviously plenty of time to get the information across. And, and frankly, from my standpoint, I'm having a hard time even wanting to support this project okay. uh, simply because, uh, you know, the information is not there and and is it possible oh. to close the testimony so that we can have a discussion with staff and then move forward? Uh, I, I just felt like we have, I just want to make sure that we're probably across uh, applicants. And so just the pleasure of the commission. Just wanted to highlight those things. I agree. Uh, I feel like I have enough information to move forward. Okay. Anybody else? One of the questions that I had from when we had previously heard some testimony on this case was, and I think that um, the applicant was getting to this point, I'm curious to know a little bit more information, even if it is um, 
anecdotal at this point about how the current owner and operator came to operate in this space and what the timeline was. I'd like to know that. Otherwise, um, I feel as though I have a good sense of what we are reviewing. And I think that there's a little bit of a disconnect between the applicant right now on what the CPC is looking at approving and what is within our realm to approve. And so I think that some of the frustration maybe from um, our standpoint is that there are very, there's a very limited scope of what we are looking at today. Um, and to help me understand, uh, I think I do have most of my information that I need, but I would like to know if, if the applicant has that information ready, readily available, how the current owner came into the space and at what time, what that time frame was. Yes. Uh, Mr. Smith came into the space because he was forcibly brought into civil court uh, with regard to his occupancy of the former location, which was properly zoned. Uh, you, would, you would realize possibly that in some parts of our community, uh, going to court to resolve uh, family matter is maybe not the best place. And as a result, of the process, uh, Mr. Smith believed that um, the reason we I put this is under seal is because we don't want to contribute in any way to uh, violence uh, in our city. But uh, he, he has reason to believe that the disposition of the civil case might have put he or his family in grave danger. This is uh, not un uh, okay. Mr. Smith is indicating he prefer to not have this information public. So the reason for the quick move was this was intended to be temporary, that we would throw ourselves at the mercy of the city and indicate that we have a, a preferred location we would jump to, but it would take. Uh, a lengthy period of time to get the property rezoned. And then Thanks. We would and, and how long has Mr. Smith been operating in this location? Uh, two and a half years. It was okay. vacant Thank you. for the five years prior. The city took no action on zoning uh, during that period of time. Okay, it's thank you very much. With Mr. Okay. Uh, of how he was uh, going to use the property, City knew that. Uh, okay, so kind of have a couple of options here from from the commission standpoint. Uh, we haven't even opened it up for public testimony yet. Uh, we can either maybe look at continuing this case to try to see if Mr. Goldblatt would get us information in uh, to city staff to get that moved forward or continue on with the process, open it up for public testimony, and then make a decision on the project after that. So just kind of curious what everybody feels like uh, moving forward here. Mr. Chair, I have enough information. I want to listen, obviously, to any public testimony, but I have enough information to keep moving with the case today. Okay. All right, so at this point in time, Joe, do you mind if we go ahead and open it up for a public testimony, please? See if anybody's raised their hand to talk about this case. Sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, no one has raised their hand. Uh, just a moment, please. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close yep. public te testimony at this time. And uh, Smith is raising his hand. Well, he's the applicant. He's, he's the actual applicant on this case. So um, so I think we're at a point here. We've got three items that we're voting on on this particular case. So again, it's an area amendment. It's the actual uh, rezoning request and then a, a, a special use permit for operation of automotive shop in this particular location. <clears throat> So, um, again, I think we'll, uh, Ms. Baxter, it looks like you might have something to add to this. Oh, I just wanted to confirm. I think there's a, core, a required quorum on 5-2 and 5-3, right? So I just Correct. want to remind everybody of that. And I, I believe it's just Commissioner Hill who's not part of that quorum. So. Correct. Okay. Yes. 
Okay. So at, at this time, we'll go ahead and close all testimony on this particular case. Uh, so commission, it, again, it appears to me that we have two options that we could follow. Uh, one is to continue uh, these docket items to another date in hopes that uh, the applicant is actually able to get something back to city staff to help their process out and so they can move forward with their project or uh, the it, just a, a vote on the cases before us based on the information that's presented uh, from the last time they were here in June as well as what they presented today. So um, based, this is Commissioner Enders. Um, based upon the potential narrative that uh, the, the location was sold to the applicant um, with knowledge of what the applicant intended to do. While I am sympathetic of that situation, uh, I do feel as though there's been sufficient amount of time and uh, enough help from city staff. Um, I have a hard time believing that city staff would have, um, you know, obstructed this process for the period of two years. And so with that, I, I'm going to go ahead and support staff's recommendation to deny 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3. Okay. So I've got a motion from uh, Commissioner Enders and seconded by Commissioner Sadowski to deny docket items 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3. Is there any other discussion from any of the commissioners on that? And would we need to vote on 5.2 and 5.3 first and then do 5.1 with uh, Commissioner Hill? Either that or we can do 5.1 first and then do yeah. the other two afterwards. So, uh, and then Lisa, I imagine you can just probably take roll call and, and note that Commissioner Hill would be uh, recused or not part of the 5.2 and 3. Yes. Okay. So if there's any, no further discussion, we'll go ahead and take a vote, please. Commissioner Allender. Aye. Commissioner Baker. Aye. Beasley. This is an aye for denial staff recommendation, right? Yes. Yeah. Aye. Crowell. Aye. Enders. Aye. And Hill for 5.1. Aye. Rojas. Aye. And Sadowski. Aye. Okay, so it's been. Uh, the cases 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3 have all been, uh, basically the application has been supported with staff's recommendation to deny all three cases. So there's a denial of all three. Uh, sorry about that applicant, but I think it's time to, time to move forward with, with that. So, okay, now let's go ahead and move to is everybody okay on, on break? I wanted to get through this uh, first um, project, this uh, docket item eight, um, because I have to leave here by noon and I'm hoping we can get through that uh, project uh, before Commissioner Hill takes over to run the meeting. Does anybody need a break or anything before or just take a break afterwards? Okay. So if you don't mind, Joe, let's go ahead with uh, docket item eight. Docket item eight, we have two companion cases and the required form on this one. It's case number CPC 2020-00062, request to approve a rezoning from district UR to district R1.5 to allow group living at 3704 Central. And docket item 8.2 is case number SUP 2020-00023, request to approve a special use permit for the same use at the same location. Uh, Chris Huey is the staff planner. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Christopher Huey, staff planner, city planning and development. As Joe stated, we have two companion cases. This case was previously heard at your September 1st meeting. So this is the continuation based on your direction for a for some follow-up information. Um, we have received quite a bit of correspondence on this, so I will kind of go through my presentation again for those who are new to the hearing, just to kind of orient them to the project. The staff letter is only minorly modified since the last hearing to include some additional letters of opposition and some minor tweaks to the language. Uh, 
Um, as Joe stated, there are two companion applications. One is a rezoning from UR Urban Redevelopment to Residential R1.5 and a companion special use permit for a group living general. Uh, location of the project is for 3704 Central Street. Essentially, the applicant needs to rezone this property to R1.5 in order to uh, obtain or seek to obtain a special use permit for the group living requested use. So the location on the site is located pretty much in the heart of the city in the Old High Park neighborhood. Here's a direct site of the, uh, or excuse me, direct location map of the site. See Broadway here on the west side of the property and central right here. Here's a street view of the um, existing uh, historic home. So again, the purpose of the applicant's goal here is to seek a, <clears throat> excuse me, to rent out the property for that's an existing larger family home to multiple tenants, which will fall under our group living category. Um, since this application is two companion cases, uh, there are two different routes that these applications will proceed after City Planning Commission makes a recommendation. The rezoning component will proceed on to the City Council, and the okay. special use permit component will proceed on to the Board of Zoning Adjustments. Um, as kind of quickly hinted on, this is an existing uh, large single family home. Uh, basically features nine bedrooms with a common area kitchen and other common area elements. Uh, the owner uh, rents these out by, on a room by room basis. Um, so the city's code basically defines any household or household living as anyone who is uh, any one individual or related individuals or no more than five unrelated individuals living in common. And a group home for the general uh, consideration of group living <clears throat> is considered any the similar circumstances, but for more than five individuals. Uh, I apologize, the text is a little small here, but I try to incorporate uh, the code definitions from um, the city's zoning development code. Um, it gets a pres more prescriptive definition of the household use and then what we define as group living. Uh, some of the applicability standards for group living is that there's an, um, at least 500 square feet of lot area per uh, allowed resident. In this case, the existing lot 6,901.5 square feet. Uh, that will allow up to 13.8 people, which given the uh, rounding criteria in the city's code, that allows up to 14 people to be on site. Uh, we look through the rezoning analysis. Um, and it's further evaluated in the staff layer, but essentially we looked at this, that the existing property was formally zoned UR as part of a uh, condominium redevelopment for the Chatham condominiums that was built to the west. Um, that phase or component of the project never took place, but this property is yet still zoned R UR. Um, so that staff does support the rezoning back to R1.5, which was the previous zoning district. Um, additionally, there are other multifamily um, dwelling units in the immediate adjacent area. So staff typically sees this as kind of a natural transition zoning to the more cohesive um, single family zoning categories further to the east. As stated, uh, here are the special use uh, permit analysis sections that are evaluated by the city's code. Uh, again, we evaluate the allowable number of persons to live on the site at any one time, which in this case would be 14. Um, we do see this as a transition density from the high density residential to the west to the lower multifamily and single family to the east. Um, it retains its existing uh, home characteristics uh, and architecture. And again, as stated, this would be a transitional intensity of uses. So um, we did, after the city plan commission meeting on September 1st, we have received additional 19 letters of, of opposition from uh, for Mr. Fine's projects and two additional layers of opposition specifically for this site at 3704 Central Street. Um, I did not include screenshots in each of every one of those letters since uh, multi several of them are multiple pages and it would be difficult to read through but they will be submitted for uh, formal consideration as we move forward with any next steps. 
So staff signing the analysis in the staff report, staff is recommending approval of both the rezoning and the special use permit. Uh, rezonings we don't attribute any conditions to typically, uh, but for special use permits we do. Um, one consideration for the City Planning Commission to perhaps look at is condition number six. We cited 14 persons based on the allowable number of persons per the zoning development code, unless further restricted by any applicable building and fire codes of the city. Um, at your last hearing, you did discuss potentially limiting that further. So just want to bring that for your attention. If you do decide to limit that further, we would need to modify condition six. Um, additionally, we have uh, added condition number seven. Um, since this, the uses typically can kind of um, cross into more of a commercial building code standpoint, and I want to stress that building code is not the same as the zoning code, that may be applicable for Mr. Fine to obtain any necessary building construction permits to adapt the home uh, for the number of tenants living on the site. And we've placed time limitations on there to either confirm that either permits are not required or that he obtained necessary permits within those certain time frames. So hence the new condition number seven. With that, I would <clears throat> conclude my presentation and turn over to the commission for any questions or the applicant for their presentation. Um, Christopher, just the last time that uh, this, this case came before us, um, well, I got a, a couple things, but the, the biggest thing I was looking for on this is, is the actual operation and how um, any language or I don't know if it's a contract or a, mm -hmm. a tenant agreement or something like that and how uh, the actual applicant runs this particular home. Has any of that been submitted uh, to the city as part of this? Because I don't see any of that in our staff report. Um, and again, it, that was a big item for me. It was submitted and it should have been included in the staff report. I will double check okay. to make sure it wasn't inadvertently missed, but it should have been included as an attachment within There's the staff. The, I'm seeing the Charlotte and Campbell house rules. Is that what you're referring to, Chris? Yes. Okay. That's yeah, on page it's one, like 171. It's, it's one page, I think. Uh, okay. It should be three or That's, three pages, I believe. Three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, let me uh, pull open the attachment so you can see from yeah, its saw, entirety. Yeah, one page that has started off with each particular house and then some work that was being done and then the third page being house rules. Um, yes, that's and, the, that's that the document. Mm -hmm. That is the business plan and the actual operation that was submitted to you for this particular home. Yes, it was. Uh, okay. Let me project my screen here momentarily. You can see it. So, Mr. Mr. Fine, uh, provide this letter here. Try to zoom in a little bit so it's a little bit more legible. And it does talk about 3704 Central and his other uh, applications that are on the docket today for, they're very similar in intent, but different locations will be heard individually. Uh, correct, and that's, that'll be my next statement. Um, okay, so I, I don't see in the house rules, uh, the property manager that was suggested there and their responsibility as well as their um, authority that they have in this particular space. Um, and I don't see anything on parking uh, as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so to just, the parking point, we did analyze it based on the required parking uh, limitations in the code. Um, and then all this property does provide enough parking based on the um, actual allowable um, number of tenants. Okay, this side actually does, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then just from my standpoint, uh, as you stated, uh, we've got several cases today, uh, which the applicant is the same on all those cases. So mm -hmm. my preference is we hear each case individually and vote on each case individually because I think they all are unique in their own 
way and character and, and that, uh, even though we probably will have public testimony that covers all of them. Um, but I prefer that we try to keep it as each individual property. That's just mine. The rest of the commission might have a different idea, but um, that's what I'm yeah, I, I would agree because I want to just make sure that when we talk about each property and if they have a property manager that we're not getting confused because just looking at the letter, it does mention some tasks for the Campbell Street property, but does that relate to the Central Street property? So I just want to make sure both in the applicant's um, testimony and the public testimony that we can make sure we're keeping track. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would just like to. I would like for people who are testifying to to testify on behalf of the property that impacts them. I guess. Um, I mean, you can always testify more, but I think we're going to see a lot of repetitive comments if we do it every time. One of and one of my biggest questions. Um, and thanks so much to Joe and the rest of the staff for putting together that memo. Um, I was. I viewed this as. Um, a need in the city that I didn't understand where it was appropriate. And based upon what I read um, and what Joe had implied was that there, there are appropriate places based upon zoning. And so I think it'll be really important just to look at the, the particular location, the geographic location also of each and to consider the zoning around each. Okay. All right, any other questions, comments uh, for staff uh, regarding docket item 8.1 and 8.2? Okay, I'm sorry, so I'm sorry, I was trying to get back so I could get unmuted. This is uh, Commissioner Beasley. Mm -hmm. Something came to mind as we were getting staff report, I don't recall us addressing and we might have when it came to capacity in the house. Uh, regarding to safety and fire. Do we have any information on requirements from that standpoint on capacity within these homes? And I think uh, what I'm going toward what I'm going toward is um, it's residential, but the numbers would be higher than the typical family. So would there be a need for increased type of uh, protection sprinkler system or anything of that nature when you've got more people in a home? Uh, good question, Commissioner. Um, so the planning stuff does not really have expertise in the building code. Um, I, from my um, novice knowledge, I'll say uh, those are very situational and dependent upon each individual site because how the building's laid out, what's composed of, um, it's adjacency to adjacent property lines can all factor into what life safety, uh, egress, ADA compliance, uh, fire suppressions if needed. Uh, hence where we've added that condition number uh, seven that the applicant obtain those necessary permits if required by the uh, our building codes team um, within the time periods prescribed or provide documentation that, that such permits are not required. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that came up that we've addressed it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So let's go ahead and introduce the applicant for this uh, docket item 8.1 and 8.2. I uh, promoted Mr. Fine a few minutes ago. He should be available. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fine, if you don't mind, just as you get started here, to uh, let us know your name and address mm -hmm. for the record. Mr. Fine, I think you're muted. Unmute, okay. Okay, I think I got gotcha. you. Uh, Mr. Fine, I have your slideshow presenting, just saying, next when you'd like to see the next slide. Okay, um, yep, that's just a, a general letter. And the um, Mr. Chairman was asking about um, um, 
the management. Um, at this house on 3704, I have a full-time manager that lives on property. And actually he works uh, right across the street um, at one of the restaurants on Broadway. So it's very convenient for him. Um, he does the day-to-day -day daily chores, make sure um, uh, everything's taken care of, clean, uh, wiped down with uh, in, uh, disinfectant. Um, he also collects rents for me sometimes if people don't send it to me by um, uh, Venmo or Zelle Transfer. He's really, really good about keeping up the property. And that's a very large property, as you know. And right now there's 11 tenants there. There's two couples. Um, so I can't imagine there would be 14 or 16 people there. In fact, I'm, I don't, I'm getting away from renting from uh, two couples. It's uh, uh, my, my new rule is going to be just uh, for single folks here. Um, at that property, we do have um, a, a, a doctor's assistant. He was he's a doctor in his country in Beirut, and you'll you'll see the letter uh, there. And and then also on the 3401 Campbell Street, it's another large property, and I have a full time manager there. Basically, the same thing. And the two other properties, me and my assistant. You'll uh, see. Mr. Fine. Let's let's just stick to the central project at this okay. point in time, and then once All we right. get to those, you can bring those up. So just just central at this time. Okay. Uh, okay, Mr. Huey, you can show. Uh, we can show some pictures. Uh, I'll show you the just. Uh, um, oh, okay. Back up a little bit. I'm sorry. I'll. Um, this is the doctor that's living at the property. Not not that letter. The one previous. He, yep, he's a doctor that's living on the property. Um, um, you know, it's just an example. We also have a couple medical students that are on rotation. I've been working with the University of Seba um, for many years now, probably eight. Um, and they go to, um, they come here and they work at St. Luke's Hospital. Okay, uh, just, I'll show just some pictures. You can just do them pretty fast. Uh, um, I just wanted, um, this is my uh, page from my website. And um, as you see, it, uh, uh, it has a one month minimum stay. Um, I just wanted to let you know about that. That's, and that's been advertising on my website. Where, where I circled. Um, so I don't do any short-term rentals or daily rentals like some of the Hyde Park people has mentioned. Okay, uh, I'll show you some pictures of the central house. Uh, I'm that's my to central, yeah. Bear with me one second. Okay. There you go. Yep. Uh, that's the front of the house. That's the living area, living room, kitchen. Uh, a bathroom, there's six bathrooms there. Oh, it's average bedroom. Oh, and that's the next That's one. the Campbell House. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. It was a maintenance guy at the door, and I didn't want my dog to start <laughs> barking. Um, yep, well, you saw some pictures. Um, now I'm in the process of uh, doing the outside of the house. Um, I did some renderings for, um, for the uh, uh, people so they could approve it. Uh, you probably have a picture in there, but we don't really need to look at it. <laughs> Did I lose you? Uh, no, I don't think you included the uh, renderings in your slideshow. 
Oh, no, I didn't. It, okay. I, I just saw it in one of the staff reports, but that's fine. These are just the various houses, the four of them that are on um, on the docket today. I just wanted to let you know about, you know, uh, a lot of the Hyde Park people think I'm running, a, a you know, like a slum or something like that. I just wanted to show you some of the I am. A, a, I used to, I'm a retired interior designer, so I kind of know my stuff. I know my taste anyways. OK. Okay, so you have anything else to add as far as the 3704 Central? Uh, you know, we heard a lot one of more, uh, one, your information one more thing, last time. Mr. Chair. Just yes. one more thing, Mr. Chair. On 3722, that's uh, two doors down. It's a vacant lot. It belongs to Maxwell. Um, I forgot his name, but anyways, he was just approved for our... It, it, went from R1 to, and he just got approved for R.1.5 um, to build a fourplex on that property. So um, I, I just wanted to um, pass that by. It's just two doors down and it just was approved um, uh, two or three months ago. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else uh, regarding the 3704 Central Street project? Are there any questions from the commissioners to uh, Mr. Fine regarding this project site? Okay. Uh, so at this point in time, I'm gonna go ahead and open it back up for public testimony. I know we took some the last time, but it sounds like maybe there might be some other people that have some comments. And so as you are promoted up uh, to speak you know, for public testimony, Please remember, we're talking about the 3704 Central Street project only. Um, there will be opportunity to speak on the other projects because we want to try to take them individually. Uh, so, if, again, so public testimony is open. Joe, do you have anybody that's raised their hand for this? We have two people. The first one is Aaron Barksdale Burns, and then it'll be Nadia Carpolo. Okay. Yeah, again, we're talking about the 3704 Central Street project. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, if you don't mind saying your uh, name and address for the record, please. Sure, my name is Aaron Burns, B-U-R-N-S, of 3712 Central Street, Kansas City, Missouri, 64111. Okay. I am located two houses to the south of the property in question. And I oppose the uh, special use permit to turn the house into a group home setting, which I believe it's already operating under. Um, and that I would like to say that it seems that the clients who are currently living there found the property on Airbnb. And so it's being run as an Airbnb currently. Um, the property that Mr. Fine mentioned, uh, the neighboring property is actually four properties to the north that was recently approved for um, for the house, the um, fourplex. Uh, I don't really see how that relates to this question, but I am concerned with, I am a single family home um, at 3712 Central and um, my neighbor next door is also a single family uh, homeowner. And we, we don't want a group home living um, just two doors down from us. There have been minor issues so far regarding fireworks and just swearing out on the front porch um, while there are kids out playing. Um, but I'm concerned with parking I'm concerned with the mold remediation from the house being vacant for 10 years prior to uh, last summer when people moved into the home. Um, I just wanted to say the property value, um, as I'm a concerned neighbor because uh, my mortgage has gone up $500 in two years based on uh, county property taxes. So um, 
but I was also mugged at gunpoint in front of my house. So I'm really concerned with the crime on my block and the property values of the block that I've been invested in since April of 2010, we've uh, lived here in this home. Um, other questions, let's see. I think that about covers it. The parking is also um, a question. Currently, you can only park on one side of the street on this block, and there are probably three parking spots behind the home, but you virtually cannot park in the driveway because that's how you access the back parking. So I have questions about the, the plan for parking. Um, I'm shocked to hear that there would be six bathrooms in the home, um, considering mine is of the same size and we have two bathrooms um, and four bedrooms. So I'm, I'm a bit shocked that, that the house could qualify for nine or more people. Uh, I'm taken aback by that. I think that completes what I wanted to say today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Joe, you said you had somebody else that raised their hand that they would like to talk on this project? Yeah, it's Nadia Carpolo and I'm promoting her right now. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Nadja Carpolo, K-A-R-P-I-L-O-W, and I live at 3820 Baltimore Avenue, Kansas City, Missouri, 64111, and that is in Old Hyde Park. Without repeating the content of the letters sent to you by uh, myself and the Old Hyde Park Board, um, indicating the troublesome nature of this case, I'd like to just a few points I found in Mr. Rex Winkle's memo. Um, if I read correctly, the definition of what Mr. Fine is doing is actually a commercial business. It's actually a lodging house, um, not a residential use. And um, there are quite a few conditions that are um, applicable to that use, um, including but not limited to um, the consent of neighbors um, because he doesn't have 55% of consent of neighbors, this is why he's asking for a special use permit. This is all if, uh, if I am reading the, the language correctly. Um, secondly, one of the conditions is that the owner rec uh, have record keeping and monitoring of the property. Um, to my understanding, Mr. Fine does not do that with the 3704 or with his other properties. Um, so I am not, um, I do not have faith in his, in his due diligence to keep records of complaints. Um, also, the property must be in compliance with codes. Um, I, just looking at 3704, there's quite a few amount of work that needs to be done and not up to code. Um, and I just think it would be negligent for the city to accept a plan um, and I quote plan, which is really just a list of rules that Mr. Fine has presented. Um, I, I question the ability of the city to enforce these rules um, and for the city to enforce its own rules, um, having to do with all of the requirements uh, uh, for, for running a lodging house. Um, he does not live in the house. So um, according to your rules, the property manager would have to live there for at least 270 consecutive days. And I do not know if that is actually happening. So I hope the commission will reject the staff recommendation to approve with condition and rule in favor of the residents who have taken the time to speak today, to write the letters that I hope you had a chance to read. And in the end really have put their heart and soul and decades of work into improving the quality of our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more people that have raised their hand, Mr. Chair. Um, Angela Split Gerber is the next one. Then okay. Deb Robinson. Okay. All right. I think I'm off mute. Am I? Am I? Am I heard? <laughs> yes, you are. Okay. 
Um, I would like to start by um, admitting the letter that I submitted that's attached to the staff report that is notarized in the evidence for this matter. Okay. Okay. Um, so with regard to this property, and, and I'm just going to say it, it's very hard to consider these properties separately because the nature of the operations is collective and the problems are collective. Um, but I, I do want to remark here that, you know, of course, we're here because this guy got in trouble for not operating according to city code. Um, he didn't just stumble into a allegedly nine bedroom, six bathroom house. He bought it and he made it that way for this express purpose. So um, he intended to do this and to violate code when he began his little business practices. Um, right now he says there's 11 tenants in a single family home. And I wanna make sure that that sinks in here. These are single family homes in residential neighborhoods. And you're talking about approving up to 14, which is three households of people. Um, that is excessive for a neighborhood and it does cause problems. Um, there are crime statistics at page 164 of the staff report for this property. Um, just in July alone, there were multiple calls, including one for an emotionally disturbed person. Um, there were calls for fireworks earlier in the year, disturbances, there are traffic calls and all sorts of things going on with this property. It is not operated well, and to the extent that there is a property manager wiping things down on the countertops or whatever, it is not accomplishing an uh, environment that meets the criteria that you are obligated to consider. And in particular, criteria B, that it will not have an adverse effect on the neighborhood. I also want to point out that we haven't heard today that this one page list of rules applies to Central. It is not labeled as such. Um, and I wanna note that there are so many things about this where it says, if there is conflict in the property, don't even call us about it. Don't even call about it several times. Um, don't bother us ever. They say never call 911, or if you do, you will be given a 30 day notice to move unless it's a real emergency. Um, clearly there's an effort here to suppress calls for help in order to um, make it look like these properties aren't as much of a nuisance. And, um, you know, this is really concerning. Um, Mr. Fine's letter to you that you have there in, in your staff report that you were just looking at, but also the letter that he sent to neighbors in the area states that he's running to people of all walks of life. Um, so you've got one letter from one guy from Beirut who's a doctor allegedly but there aren't 11 doctors in this property. Um, and Mr. Fine has a number of tenants here. Um, the, fact that, the fact that he is an interior designer and may have pretty curtains, it doesn't solve the problems associated with cramming 11 to 14 people into a single family home in a neighborhood. And so um, we really encourage you. And I also wanted to point out, I believe that there are actually over 30 letters that have been sent um, and so we do want to just ask you to deny this and to take this collectively into consideration as you consider the other properties. Okay, thank you very much. Next person I just promoted is Deborah Robinson. Okay. Hello. Hi, Can Deborah. You hear me? Hi. Yes. My name is Deborah Robinson, and I'm at 3705 Warwick here in the Old Hyde Park Historic District. And um, I would really just like to echo what Angela and Nadja have said before. It is simply a case that I think Mr. Fine's uh, reputation has preceded him. There are multiple, multiple. Uh, uh, evidence that these his properties are not being well run. Uh, he may have a manager, but that does not mean his house manager is adhering to the quiet enjoyment of, of his tenants or the neighbors uh, that are surrounding these properties. Um, 
I, I really have to question why there has been an approval given the uh, opposition that, that we have encountered already in, in our neighborhood, as well as uh, the occurrences with some other properties of his. So I would ask the commission to reconsider um, the input of, the, of neighbors and uh, others in the neighborhood who have a stake in uh, seeing that we have success in, in, in our urban core in terms of making this a, 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 a great place to live that people want to come to. Uh, I see that initially there was a five year plan or I guess an approval. Now, I, I, would that always be with this property? If Mr. Fine were to sell 3704 Central, would that, uh, would that caveat go with the property or would that, would that end whenever uh, should he no longer be the, the owner of this property? And that, uh, that I appreciate your oh. allowing me input. Yeah, I think, Joe, if you can answer that question, maybe. Yeah, if you guys approve the special use permit and ultimately if the Board of Zoning Adjustment approves it, it runs with the land. It doesn't matter who the owner is. Mm -hmm. Because... Uh, the folks on the commission, there is not an historic property that was built, I'm assuming around the turn of the century or in the 20s when uh, 3704 Central was built that had nine bedrooms and six bathrooms. It was created for essentially a, uh, a group home living, but there isn't a, a group, a, a, a unifying uh, reason for this group home other than just to sell out these rooms. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Anybody else, Joe? Two more people have raised their hand, Jordan Smith and then Jeff Callender. I'm promoting Jordan first. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Jordan Smith and I live at 812 East Linwood. And I just wanted to quickly amplify uh, what Ms. Split Gerber said, which is essentially that you should really take in mind not to look at these in isolation. Um, and that the effect on these neighborhoods is collective, that there is a pattern and practice of behavior with Mr. Fine and his properties that sort of belies the idea that these are just sort of wonderful doctors and visiting interns. Um, there are actually, um, obviously, if you look at them together, there is a record that he works outside of code and outside of zoning. Um, in his interactions with the neighbors, it's obfuscation constantly and sort of moving the ball whenever uh, uh, issues get raised. There are similar patterns of crime and disturbance in around these houses. And so I just, I just, you know, wanted to sort of amplify what, um, what Ms. Blickgarber said and the other neighbors. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Promoting Jeff Callender now. And Mr. Chair, while I'm promoting him, um, uh, another hand was raised for George Moss, whom we haven't heard for, but Angie Splitgerber also raised her hand again. Would you like me to call her first or George? Or what would you like me to do? Um, if, let's go ahead and, and hear the new testimony. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, yeah, this is Jeffrey Callender, and I'm going to go ahead and, with all re due respect, I would as well like to echo um, the previous testimony that this needs to be looked at organically, in my opinion. That he is essentially building a, co uh, a complex of these uh, institutions and scattering them throughout our neighborhoods. Uh, I will re basically hold on to my comments until it comes up to the properties on my block. However, my recollection from the last meeting is there were a number of stipulations that the commission had asked Mr. Fine to do, such as a detailed business plan, how he would address um, all of these issues as well as crime, how we can run this business. And I think we can all agree that the page of rules um, does not constitute a business plan 
Um, and I believe there was also, he was supposed to speak with the police department as well. But with that, I will stand down and wait till the uh, properties on my block are addressed. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Callender, can you give us your address for the record, please? Oh, certainly. I'm at 3119 Charlotte Street. Thank you. I just promoted George Moss. Okay. Hi, George, when you come off the mute, uh, do you mind saying your name and address for the record, please? Here is, can you hear us? Yes. Hi. Okay, uh, I'm Claudia Tumim. I'm the wife of George Moss. He's here with me. And we used to live um, just the in that block, actually, at uh, 3819 Baltimore. So we're familiar with the uh, the neighborhood, very familiar with the neighborhood. We lived there for, um, what, a decade or so, I think. And we know the neighbors and we know how much they have put into um, their homes, the, the uh, extreme um, uh, care and work that they've gone to, to, to uh, bringing those houses back and bringing the neighborhood back to, um, what it once was and um, we sympathize with them that they don't want this sort of um, uh, re shall I call it residence or business in the neighborhood um, and also that that there have been so many problems um, that we are seeing with with Mr. Fine and his intentions and we just noticed that um, in the letter that was written by the person he was calling a, a physician uh, a doctor that that person did not indicate that he was uh, a doctor. He indicated that he was that volunteering medicine. in um, uh, for medical issues, but not that he was a doctor. And that once again indicates that that Mr. Fine either doesn't know what he's talking about or he um, is just blatantly lying. Um, and also, I would like to uh, I note that um, Angie Splitgerger. Split, Ber Split Gerber has Charles Lee with her and that he would like to speak and that's why her hand was up. Um, uh, can you tell me your address and, where you're located now? Oh, I'm so sorry. We're currently at, at 1006 East 33rd, uh, but we did live at 3819 Baltimore uh, until we moved here. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, one last thing. Um, Th that house doesn't look to to George and, and me like um, it could handle the number of people. Um, it certainly doesn't look like it should have six bedrooms, so the yeah, maximum yeah. number, or, or bathrooms, the maximum number of people that should even be in that house is probably five, but that's pushing okay. it. Yep. Thank you for your opinion. Uh, who's next, uh, Joe? It's Angie Split Gerber, perhaps with the additional person that okay. might be her computer. So I'll promote her. Okay. Thank you. My apologies. Um, Charles Lee is just attending here because he is worried about um, capability, electronic technical difficulties, and he did want to speak. And I failed to um, say that earlier. Also, um, my for the record, my name is Angie Splitgerber and I'm at 3341 Campbell Street. Go ahead. Good morning, my name is Charles Lee. I live at 3412 Campbell Street. I just want to echo the complaints and uh, points of view of the people that have spoken previous to me. Uh, the especially the fact that these houses were three bedroom houses, some were four bedroom houses, and to have seven or eight or more bedrooms is just the fact that the dining room has been chopped up and the other parts of the house have been chopped up to make little bathrooms and little bedrooms. Uh, it's a detriment to the neighborhood and uh, I agree with everyone what has been said and just want to emphasize that the neighborhood should not be sold out for an investor just trying to take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Joe? 
No one else has raised their hand on this one. Okay. So at this time, we'll go ahead and close public testimony. Um, and so, Mr. Fine, you're given an opportunity here to talk about uh, some of the comments raised up, but I think, frankly, a lot of them have already been addressed or discussed at some point in time. Uh, so if you can keep it brief as to your statements regarding the public testimony. Mr. Fine, you're on mute. I can't, sorry, I can't hear you. How about now? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, it, it, that's why I showed the pictures. Uh, for example, 3401 Campbell Street, you could see that the living room is huge. The kitchen is huge. I uh, never Mr. chopped Fine, up I don't, any. I don't care about the Campbell Street oh. project at this time. We're talking oh, about Central. Okay. Oh, okay, yes, sir. Um, yes, um, there is six uh, bathrooms there, and they're all very uh, nicely done. I think the um, uh, the third floor, I uh, added uh, three bedrooms. Uh, so that's where the, the, I guess, the extra size comes uh, from. It was, uh, when I bought the house, it was, uh, somebody started to, to redo the third floor. Uh, so I just uh, finished it, basically. And there's a bathroom on the third floor also. Um, and regards to the lady who said about the, a doctor. She didn't see a doctor. I'm. I'm reading the letter. It says, "And I earned my mat." Uh, okay, I am an um, international medical graduate. I got my MD from the University of Tripoli, Libya, and he earned his master's uh, uh, degree at the University of Atlanta, Georgia. But I don't know why. Uh, why that makes a difference. But uh, oh, and then about the uh, police uh, uh, problems. I have, I've had a meeting with um, Officer Singer uh, about a week ago, and he was supposed to join the meeting to explain, um, but he, he couldn't uh, hang on. Um, I got an email from him. He couldn't hang on until, uh, he could only hang on until 10 o'clock. But anyways, he's in the law enforcement for group homes especially. And um, so I had a meeting with him, and there has been no police reports on any of my properties um, at all. There's been events, uh, for example, um, one car was towed away um, and that is, a, 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 there's a fire hydrant uh, in front of the house or, or close by, maybe maybe that happened. And um, there was a, an incident of a firework problem on July 5th. <laughs> But I had a, a meeting with him, and there's been no police reports at all. Um, for example, um, okay, um, let's go ahead that's and wrap it up, Mr. Fine. Okay, that's 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 all I can say about okay. 37 and 4. Okay, okay thank, you, thank you. So at this time, we're going to close uh, any testimony, and it'll just be amongst the commission at this time. Uh, but I did have one comment. I believe uh, uh, one of our city inspectors is on on the call, does anybody have any questions or thoughts uh, with our city inspector on this project? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and talk amongst the commission here before we come to a motion, if, if, unless this somebody is, wants to make a motion. Sure, this is Commissioner Enders. Um, I think that we all have, uh, or, or many of us, I felt, shared that there's a, an urgent need for this type of option in Kansas City. Um, it was, again, I appreciate uh, Joe and staff providing that memo. It helped me understand um, where this is currently allowed for. And I think that the testimony today is evidence that um, the zoning of where this is allowed is, is really important. And I understand why a single family home owner in one of these neighborhoods would not anticipate that a home that looks like theirs uh, might house many more individuals than they anticipate. And so based upon the testimony today, based upon um, you know, not having been provided a ton of um, 
confidence in, in the type of operation, although I am sympathetic to the need in the city, um, I cannot support a special use permit for this property. Okay. Um, I'll go next. Uh, similar to Commissioner Enders, I do believe this is the critical need for the city. Um, I want to be clear that I think renters are able to live in all parts of the city. They shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be pressure to only have uh, homeowners in different parts of the city. So I think that plays a part in some of the testimony, which I think is problematic. Um, I don't think we are currently there to, um, to approve a condition such as this, um, given the operations that we've heard and kind of the, the evidence we've seen. Um, but even at the five person maximum mark, um, based on the rental rates, you're clearing close to $3,000 a month and um, that shouldn't negatively impact the business, especially when it's a single family home. So I'm not in support of it currently. I do believe that we need to look at how this plays out in the future um, because there is a need um, to have more rentals uh, available and this type of rental in the future. So I'm not in favor currently. Okay. Yeah, I would I would echo um, both Commissioner Enders and Baker on their statements, um, but I also feel, um, you know, just to say once again, you know, it's to me, it's not necessarily a question of multifamily or density. I think if you had a building on, that's similar to what you see across the street, uh, colonnade type building, it would be perfectly fine and suitable for that neighborhood. I think the fact that the scale of that house has so many bedrooms in it and was not suited and designed for that kind of use is problematic. Um, I also kind of want to step away from this, just this case and say, I think there's some, some examining that we need to do in terms of the classification and use, um, because I think putting it under the group living designation is, is not quite meeting the intent, I believe, of what group living is. If you look at the other classifications, even though it's not limited to that, they're all institutional type uses, uses that have licensing requirements beyond what the city would do. So in terms of holding people to the rules, there's already some other third party agency that's gonna hold them to some sort of um, rule. So I think cases like this, I would define as, for lack of a better term, non-institutionalized co-living, um, just I don't think exist in our code. And I think there's actually a reason they don't exist because um, going back to tenement housing and issues of overcrowding, this was something that fell out of favor because of the nuisance and because of the issues. So I think if we're going to look at this kind of co-living situation, um, we need to be intentional about it. And we actually need to create a use designation for it just like we did the short-term rentals and have um, a lot of impact, neighborhood impact and feedback on that. Um, so yes, I, I just don't feel like it meets the intent of group living and I don't think it fits with the neighborhood. Okay. Anybody else want to comment? I, I would just like to echo what the, the, all the commissioners have said so far. I, I agree with Commissioner Sadowski. I think it doesn't meet the intent of group living, uh, reading the memo that was given to us by staff. And I think that's a policy that needs to be either looked at the by the commission or by the council. But uh, before I'm comfortable in moving forward, especially with the testimony that we've heard back from the the, the community, um, I'm just very uncomfortable to to move this forward today and vote in favour of it. Okay. Anybody else? Can I just mention one thing? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Fine. We're, we've closed testimony for now, and we're talking amongst the commission before we move, move ahead on a, on a motion. This is Commissioner Beasley. Mm -hmm. And I, too, echo some of the, the things that my former commissioners have stated. Um, I'm looking at the fact we have nothing that really helps us keep these properties to a standard. Um, looking at what was in the memo, the thing that I'm, I'm still missing is how do we keep the Airbnbs to standards as well? Uh, those are types of rentals that are short term in nature, but could be for longer periods of time than say a four day weekend. 
So I'm not in favor of this uh, at this time either. Okay. Chair Crow, uh, again, to echo everyone's sentiments, I also think when we um, are thinking about policy provisions for standards, we also are looking at need versus impact. Um, I think if we don't have folks who hold their properties to a high standard, who are really critically vetting uh, folks that are living in these neighborhoods, we could potentially um, create uh, a context where homeowners leave, they move. And then we have a historical vibrant neighborhood that has abandoned houses that impacts our tax base. And so just want us to kind of think about what that looks like as well when we hear um, just uh, neighborhoods consistently providing documentation to talk about the standard and the quality and the lack thereof. I'm prepared to make a, a motion um, if you all are willing on docket items 8.1 and 8.2. Um, recommending um, denial. Okay, so I have a motion. I would second. Okay, so I have a motion from Commissioner Hill for denial and a second by Mr. Commissioner Allender. Uh, Lisa, do you mind taking roll call, please? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Corral? Uh, I vote aye. And I also want to say, you know, just same thing all the rest of the commissioner said. I, I, I'm in agreement with everything that was said. We do need to look at maybe the standard for this kind of thing. But I am kind of concerned about this particular project in this location with this particular management. So, uh, so aye. Commissioner Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. And Sadowski? Aye. Okay, so it looks like the motion passes uh, for denial of docket items 8.1 and 8.2 uh, for the items requested. Uh, so with this, uh, it is past lunchtime. I believe we're gonna take a break. Uh, I am actually going to leave the meeting and, and Commissioner Hill's gonna take over as chair the rest of the meeting out. And so Commissioner Hill, I'll leave it up to you how long you wanna take a break. I think at least 10 minutes for everyone. Is that enough, is that enough time for everybody to get a sandwich and do what they need to do? Okay. I think so, I need 15. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so it's 12.25 to my clock, and so I'll look to get everybody back by 12.40. Thank you.
Simplify diabetes. Simplify life. Omnipop. Whether it's rides to roll over or an overdue makeover. And with their insurance, it was no cost to them. That service you can. There's an exotic place where you can swim in the sky.
how they're viewing this election. All right, looks like we might have everyone back. Um, Commissioner uh, Rojas, are you there? And Commissioner Beasley. Yes, I'm back. Okay. All right, um, Joseph, do you want to start with the next um, docket item? we Will do. <clears throat> All right, so the next case is docket item nine, and we have two companion cases starting with 9.1, case number CPC 2020-00063. A request to approve a rezoning from district R2.5 to R1.5 in order to construct a duplex on about 0.28 acres at 3408 Charlotte. And docket item 9.2, case number SUP 2020-00022, request to approve a special use permit for group living in District R2.5 on about a quarter of an acre at the same location. Christopher Huey is the staff committer. Well, my commissioners, I just realized a typo I had in my report here, Barrett. Sorry. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, commissioners. Again, Christopher Huey, staff planner, city planning and development. <clears throat> As Joe stated, we have two companion cases very similar to the previous uh, application you heard. It's for a rezoning application from R2.5 to R1.5 and for a special use permit for group living general use. <clears throat> the current property is located at 3408 Charlotte. Uh, relatively to this uh, similar area of the city, there's a more specific site location. Mr. Huey, this is Robert. Can I can I save some time for you guys? I I, I read the staff reports and. Um, and I do understand uh, these two cases are are denied. So I'm I'm going to go ahead with that. So um, can we just take it off the uh, uh, docket? And I agree with um, the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Fine. We'll just go ahead and proceed with the staff report, and then we'll move through. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so here's a street view of the subject property. Um, and this is very similar text to as last time. Uh, the really only difference here is this is a large single family home with five bedrooms, similar common area elements. Um, here, this is again, very similar text to the last one. The staff analysis of this particular section did state with the, since it's a double lot that's been combined at some point in the past, um, that does have, like, have approximately 12,000 square foot of lot area which with the five um, required 500 square foot lot area per person would allow up to 24 people. Um, <clears throat> in this case, staff did at institute a condition to actually bring that number down, uh, given the size of the building uh, versus the liars, it, it's not quite a direct comparison. <clears throat> um, here for this particular case, um, we found that the surrounding property is very, pretty cohesively zoned R-2.5, which is a typically a more dense single family district or two family residential district. Um, that, and that's kind of what we found for the uses of the surrounding properties. Uh, again, with this particular case there, we with the ordinance conditions, it would allow up to 24 persons uh, to live on the property, which again, we'll be addressing here shortly. Um, <clears throat> There is a compatible scenario since there's only five bedrooms that it may be compliant, but that's not our understanding of what the applicants looking to do. They're looking to do more than five persons. 
it has it will retain the same character and um, be able to uh, provide and fit in with the architectural um, character found in the area. Um, while this in from in kind of touching on to the limitations, while the code does allow up to 24 people based on the zoning regulations, uh, staff is recommending a limitation down to 10, I believe it is. Yes. Um, <clears throat> additionally, for this particular uh, site, there's the same 19 letters of uh, additional letters of opposition we've received, plus an additional nine letters of opposition, 20 in total for this particular site. Uh, based on the analysis of the staff, um, while we understand that you know, you know this type of use has purpose, the recommendations of the land use area plan <clears throat> and really the incompatible nature of the surrounding land uses where the first case had a little bit more mix and variety of uh, residential densities, this one's pretty cohesive. Uh, so therefore staff is recommending the denial of the rezoning and special use permit. Um, should the commission recommend approval, we have instituted five conditions for your use, uh, very similar, uh, limiting the special use permit to a total of five years, limiting the number of persons allowed to live on site uh, down to 10 people. Um, again, the applicant shall refrain from advertising on any short term rental sites um, and any short term rental, <clears throat> excuse me uses shall be prohibited unless otherwise uh, obtained by a future entitlement process and the same condition that any necessary building permits that may be required are obtained within six months and completed within 12 months from approval by the board of zoning adjustments uh, with that i would conclude my presentation um, i do want to state since uh, mr fine has stated uh, withdrawing his application that if he so chooses to do so that uh, ends this application in its place and would no longer proceed to plan or excuse me to city council and, and board of zoning adjustment. So just want to get that on the record. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions um, from the commissioners to staff? Okay, hearing none. Um, the applicant, Mr. Fine, do you want to restate uh, your position? Are you withdrawing or are you okay with the denial, us voting for your denial? Mr. Fine, you're muted. Okay. I'll agree with the denial. I know it's a. Uh, the reason I was rezoning to R.1.5 would be to do the group living, but the R-2 won't allow group living. So uh, basically everything's um, mute, moot. So yes, I'll agree with the denial and I will withdraw my application. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, now we'll get to, um, oh, well, Joseph, has there, is there anyone there that's raising their testimony? Keeping in mind that um, the applicant with the staff recommendation of denial. Um, we did, we, there was someone who had raised their hand, but I believe they lowered it after Mr. Now, here we go. Someone raised their hand. Um, Tony G. I'll promote Tony G. you have been uh, promoted and unmuted please feel free to give your testimony can you hear me yes hi my name is jerry guy and i live at 3403 charlotte so this directly across the street from 3408 and 3412 and i just wanted some clarification so with mr fine withdrawing his application and that he agrees with the decision that the, the committee made does that mean that the current use of the home will remain the same? There are at least five people, individuals that are non-related that are living there now. Does that, is that, um, um, is he within code to do that? Or does that change? Because it is a single family home. Um, Madam Chair, I think I can help answer that. Um, so based on the city's definition of the ho what household is, it can include for unrelated individuals, either by blood or by marriage, um, that allows up to five individuals to live on site. So um, 
if there are no more than five individuals, then he would be co-compliant to rent them out to those individual persons. Um, as far as the withdrawal and joke, feel free to jump in here if I missed anything. If he's withdrawing his application that stops and it's, it's kind of done today, um, otherwise it would have proceeded to plan committee, excuse me, to city council and board of zoning adjustments based on the recommendations of the city planning commission. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if the commission withdraws it, the case is just kind of dead in, dead in the water and we proceed with our enforcement cases on the code cases we currently have. If the commission recommends denial, then it's technically not a final decision. So it has to go on to city council to be denied um, ultimately. Um, otherwise it's still a pending case. This is exactly. So if you, I mean, I would just suggest that if there's a desire for the applicant to withdraw that we may just want to dismiss. That's, that's what I would suggest. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I'll go ahead then and, and move to continue this off docket, if that's the correct way to do that. Um, Commissioner Anders, it would be a motion to dismiss. Okay, then uh, I move to dismiss docket items number 9.1 and 9.2. Is there a second? Second. Second, yeah. Has been moved and second. Um, Lisa, can you call for the vote? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Commissioner Beasley? I'm sorry, aye. Uh, oh, Y'all hearing me? Uh huh, that did. Okay. Uh, the second time. Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. Rojas? Oh, okay. I, you mm -hmm. hear me now? Yep. Okay. And Sadowski. Aye. All right. The motion to dismiss docket item 9.1 and 9.2 uh, is unanimous with seven votes. Um, thank you. We can move on to the next docket item. All right. Um, Madam Chairwoman, the docket, the next docket item is number 10. Case number SUP 2020-00015. Request your approved a special use permit for group living use at 3120 Campbell Street. And again, Christopher Huey is the staff planner. Good afternoon again, commissioners. Uh, Christopher Huey, staff planner. Uh, again, here is a uh, just a special use permit application for group living general for 3120 Campbell Street. The property is already zoned R1.5, which allows this use with the approval of a special use permit. Again, very similar location. And here's more of a direct site plan to, for orienting where, where the particular site's located. Here's a street view of the existing home. And as kind of similar to the previous cases, this is existing large single family home. It features ex uh, existing seven bedrooms with common area elements. Um, therefore, up to more than five unrelated persons could be living in common with this particular home. Uh, therefore, the need for a special use permit for group living general use. Uh, again, the same criteria it's being evaluated for the similar group living uses. In this particular case, the lot is about 4,900 square feet. Um, that allows up to uh, 9.89 individuals, um, which would obviously be rounded up to a full 10. Um, so there are examples of converted multifamily unit homes in the area. Uh, additionally, there appears to be some existing group, a group home to the Northeast. Uh, while this is not a direct comparison, uh, that property is zone B3-2, which is a commercial zoning, and that and group home living, or excuse me, group living is allowed by right in that zoning district. So while nearby is technically in a different zoning district. Um, the home will maintain its existing character and architectural uh, feel. And uh, most of the homes in the area have retained a, some single family 
uh, use primarily, but there are examples of converted homes and some multi-unit homes in the area. Uh, for this particular case, we've it's the same 19 letters, additional letters of opposition. We did not receive any uh, individual letters of opposition for this particular site. <clears throat> With this particular case, staff does recommend approval of the group living uh, special use permit. Uh, very similar conditions. I do want to point out in condition number two, uh, I believe we had an error or typo in that condition number two. It should be actually 10 people is the total, uh, total number of people to live on site. With that, we conclude my presentation, turn over for any questions or the uh, comments of Mr. Fine. Thank you. Okay. Question, wait, hold on, Mr. Fine. Are there sure. any questions for commissioners to um, Christopher? Okay. Seeing none, we'll open it up to the applicant. Okay, Mr. Fine. This is your time. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, when when we had the um, the public hearing over Zoom, um, two people uh, called in about the property, which, which was in opposition, and then um, all the other uh, uh, Hyde Park members from the 3400 block called in. So that's where all those 19 letters, I believe, come from. But I have uh, with me, and I'm sorry to say I didn't um, uh, put it in the, um, the file. I have six uh, letters of approval um, that I've um, gathered. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, the, the, the people, some people stay there for a long time, but most people are there for a month to th uh, three months. <laughs> The, and I forgot to mention this, uh, but all the properties are very similar. What one month to three months? Basically, it helps people uh, get a completely furnished place, uh, nicely furnished, all bills paid for one price while they're in town for working or or doing a student or just in between apartments. I just wanted to reiterate that, and everything else is um, basically. The same. Thank you, Ms. Payne. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions that you have for the uh, applicant, Mr. Fine? This is Commissioner Anders. Uh, Mr. Fine, how long have you been operating this property as it stands now? It's been about probably seven years, and thank you very much for that question. I wanted to remind all the commissioners there. Um, uh, before I got, um, Angela keeps saying I, I got in trouble and I'm trying to change my tune. That's not the case. Um, I was uh, Christina Johnson in the code compliance branch. I believe it's Christina. Um, yep, she came uh, and I walked her through the houses and she did tell me I need to get a special use permit to, uh, to do this. I did not know it was against the law or against the codes. Uh, I'm not trying to play naive, but this is uh, what, what, why I'm uh, doing these special use permits, why I'm applying for it. I'm, I'm not trying to skirt the law and whatever the commission uh, says or Christina, I will abide by uh, the guidelines. Thank you for that question. Yes, it's been a long time. I think I bought the house in, ooh, uh, maybe 2013 or so. I'm not quite sure. I could look it up for you. Um, but yes, all my, I've been doing this for quite a long time. So I have a question. It seems that there's yeah. seven bedrooms in the house. Is that correct? Mr. Fine. Yes, uh, three bedrooms downstairs and four bedrooms upstairs. So the staff recommendation is to be no more than 10, but would you be open to being no more than seven, which would designate no more than one person per bedroom? I, I would love to stipulate that. Um, I, 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 like I mentioned before, I'm steering away from renting to couples. It's not that I'm prejudiced or anything. It's like 
I just feel it's too many people per, per house. And I, I'm just interested in um, giving people a safe and a comfortable place to live while they're um, uh, a lot of, we get a lot of interns over the summer from uh, August, uh, um, from May to August. Uh, that's all I'm really interested in. The, and the people are very uh, busy. They're always out or sightseeing if they're not from, uh, from town here. Okay, yes, I would love to stipulate that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right. Um, we can move on to public testimony. Uh, Joseph, is there anyone that um, have raised their hand specific to um, address 3120 Campbell? Yes, <clears throat> we have four people so far, starting with Alan Hallquist. I'm going to go ahead and promote Alan. Mr. Hallquist, I uh, you should be able. Oh, there you go. All right. Hi. Uh, my name is Alan Hallquist. I live at 17 Jansen Place. I've lived in the Hyde Park neighborhood for 39 and a half years. I'm the president of the Hyde Park Neighborhood Association. I'm making these comments on behalf of the Hyde Park Neighborhood Association. And although I'm addressing 3120 Campbell, these comments apply equally to 3401 Campbell and 3112 Charlotte, which you'll be hearing next. But so that you don't have to listen to me three times, I'll give you these. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mr. Fine's properties have been and continue to be problem properties in the neighborhood. These blocks are blocks largely, as Christopher said, of single family uh, owner occupied homes. Uh, the, as, as you can see from an attachment from the Kansas City Police Department that's attached to Angela Splitgerber's letter, between August of 2018 or January 2018 and August 2020, there were 203 calls to the Kansas City Police Department for service to these homes of Mr. Fine. Mr. Fine states that he rents to people from St. Luke's or interns, but we found that not to be true. There have been numerous problems, which the letters, over 20 letters from adjacent homeowners, residents, people residing nearby, uh, list uh, a litany of problems from these properties and from the tenants. The fact that rule seven on its proposed rules states do not call 911 or you'll get a 30 day notice to be evicted no no well managed proper property with reasonable tenants no landlord tells its tenants don't call 911 the reason that that rule is there is because the neighborhood is tired of all the police continually coming about seven times a month to mr fine's properties there's been multiple code violations the property's been violated in, or operated in violation of zoning. He continues to operate them in violation of zoning. He's admitted at neighborhood meetings that he knows that they're not, they do not comply with zoning. There's insufficient parking. Um, we had a neighborhood association meeting on September 15. There was a large group of people who attended the neighborhood meeting. Mr. Fine and his representative made a presentation there was no support for Mr. Fine's uh, proposals for any of these properties. I specifically asked, does anyone want to raise your hand or speak in favor of Mr. Fine's request to the City Plan Commission? And there was no support. And, and lots of heated, agitated, passionate uh, pleas for us to do something. Um, on September 22nd, Mr. Fine had um, engagement meetings by video. I think I've seen yeah. One of the reports that he submitted saying that there were nine people who attended, or as he now says, only two opposed it. There were over 20 some computers that were logged on and multiple sites had more than one or two people attending. Again, I asked, is there anybody here who speaks in favor of Mr. Fine's request? And there was no support. Mr. Fine mentioned at the time that uh, a neighbor named Chris supported it and uh, one of the persons on the call is the adjacent neighbor to Chris. He contacted Chris and then came on the video and said, 
he just talked to Chris who was at work and Chris does not support it. Just like Mr. Fine now says he's got six letters of support that we don't see. There's 100% opposition from the nearby neighbors. There's 100% opposition from the neighborhood association. And in particular, I'd refer you to Angela Splitgerber's well-documented letter with multiple exhibits uh, explaining what the neighborhood has been going through on and on for years dealing with these properties. It's legal for Mr. Fine to provide household living. He can rent to five unrelated individuals at his properties. That's fine. We have homes in Hyde Park that do that. He seeks a special use permit for group living to have more than five unrelated persons. The, the city ordinance defines group living as residential occupancy of a unit by any collection of individuals not meeting the definition of a household. And examples of group living are set out in the ordinance section 88-805-02-B. And the examples include fraternities, sororities, convents, monasteries, and nursing homes organizations that have collections of individuals, not people coming and going for one month, two months, three month stays in and out of the property. Uh, Mr. Fine's properties do not meet the definition of group living and therefore the, the request should be denied. There's no justifiable basis for the city plan commission to ignore the wishes of the neighborhood, to ignore the wishes of the, all the nearby neighbors and grant a special use permit that doesn't meet the definition under his occupancy. He seeks 10 unrelated people in, in some properties up to 14 in others. In a neighborhood of single family residents with children on the block. This, these blocks, these particular blocks of these three properties are single family homes. The, they're diverse neighborhoods, there's elderly, there's young people, there are married families, there are children, there's gay, they're straight. It's, these neighborhoods pro project what would be a television advertisement for a great neighborhood. And, and Mr. Fine's use is inconsistent. We have six plexes, we have duplexes, you can go on Linwood, there are 12 plexes. There are a number of rental properties in the neighborhood that are welcome, that operate legally, but Mr. Fine doesn't. And, and it doesn't help to improve, I'm, I'm gonna be frank with you, it doesn't help to, to approve it and impose conditions because the city will not enforce them. And Mr. Fine has op operated illegally for years. We've had Councilman Bunch attend a meeting in the past to discuss Mr. Fine's properties. We've had the Kansas City Police Department there a meeting with Mr. Fine and nearby neighbors, and it, it just goes on. We, we continually battle short-term rentals, party houses advertised on Airbnb in the neighborhood, and there's no enforcement of the city ordinances. So uh, imposing conditions is not uh, a reasonable way to deal with this. He may have up to five unrelated people. That makes him $3,000 a year. His requests are regressive for the Hyde Park neighborhood, which has a history of people moving in, improving their homes, making it a true neighborhood, and it'll be uh, have a negative impact on people wanting to live in the neighborhood around Mr. Fine's property. And my comments apply to the next two cases you'll receive too. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Halkless. Uh, Joe, will you promote the next uh, speaker? Yes, the next, the next person is Melissa. And then after that, Madam Chair, we have four additional people, Michelle Davis, Suzanne McGill, Angie Splitgerber, Stacy Lake, and Jeff Callender. I guess that's five people. I would just uh, ask for the participants that will be speaking next. If there are uh, additional items other than what has been clearly articulated by Mr. Holloquest or that has been, uh, excuse me, what has been provided to the commissioners in the packet, if you would um, stick to those, we, we um, heard a lot of testimony and have also received documentation. The next participant, please feel free to state your name and give us your address. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Melissa Zarda. I own the um, property directly across the street from 3120 with some partners. Um, we have long-term tenants in the home and um, I submitted a letter. I don't see it in the PDF. I'm afraid it might have gotten stuck in with one of the other case numbers for one of the other properties. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I voiced my concerns today. Also, I'm speaking on behalf of our tenants who really wanted to be here, but both were unable to take off because of work. So um, I, I will keep it short, but the, the main thing is what has already been voiced that we're afraid that if this is approved, the city will not be able to have the resources to enforce the ordinances like they haven't in the past. Um, our tenants have had run-ins with people um, who live across the street, the short-term Tenants are not invested in the neighborhood. Um, parking is an absolute nightmare. It's a one-way street between two very busy streets. Many of the homes don't have driveways. Um, it totally fills up the road. Um, there have been calls from 911, paramedics, police, you name it, over the years to that address constantly. Uh, we've learned in all of these other meetings and doing our own research that there's been a habit of renting the sex offenders at his properties. Um, our tenants have a child this is terrifying to them, obviously. Um, I mean, everything else has probably pretty much been mentioned. I just wanted to go ahead and voice my strong opposition. Thank you. Thank you. So next, next person is Michelle Davis. Michelle, if you Hello. Want to state Hi. your full name and give us your address, please. Michelle Davis, uh, 33. 29 Campbell. I am um, part owner of a rental on the uh, 3119 and was not sure if my letter got attributed to this case um, because I did do a, a group email. Um, just want to make sure that, again, my opposition to this was noted and reiterate what Mr. Hallquist uh, stated that in our widely attended Zoom call on this property, not a single person supported the proposed variance. So that's all I'll say, thank you. Next person is Suzanne McGill. Suzanne, please uh, feel free to begin your testimony and add your address, please. Suzanne, you're, are you unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, this is Suzanne McGill from 825 East 31st Street. So we're two properties away from um, Robert Fine's property on Campbell. Um, and I just want to, you know, quickly mention a couple of points. Um, 3109 Campbell, which is Pride Haven, I don't think can really be uh, a direct comparison to, to Robert Fine's property. That property is operated as a nonprofit for 35 years. Um, Save Inc. is actually the uh, the nonprofit organization that runs it and manages it very well. We're so happy to have it in the neighborhood, but it, we just can't compare it to Robert Fine's property. Um, I, I think the issue that I really want to speak to here is that this is um, this is the opportunistic, you know, maximizing profits, taking a single family home, cramming as many people as possible into it, um, you know, to maximize the rental income. Um, he's already allowed five on this property. I think that that's sufficient. And I think um, the neighborhood and the neighbors would be great with that. And this wouldn't change, you know, the feel of the community and the character and the, and the continuity that we have. Um, in these couple of blocks. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we've seen, you know, through the history of his properties, the, the difficulty he's had, you know, managing these tenants and, and managing the nuisances. And so I think, you know, if we just keep adding more people, it's only going to be more compounded. Um, and we just request that, that you deny, deny um, you know, allowing more people in these homes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the uh, next person is Angela Splitgerber. 
Madam Chair, if I may, I would um, ask that you call on Stacy Lake first. She's immediately at that block. I believe her testimony may reduce um, the length of mine. And um, I believe that she also has a time constraint. If we could allow her to go before me. I just promoted Stacy Lake, Madam Chair. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Please. Yes. Yes, hi. My name is Stacy. Like I live on three one one two Campbell Street, and uh, we're here to. We're also opposed to this uh, uh, to the special variance request. If you're unfamiliar with the property, it's unlikely that ten, let alone fourteen people, can fit into such a small building. But even so, there has been some concerns, and these concerns we have brought up to Mr. Fines with his tenants, who none of the tenants that live at this property are medical students or I believe college students, but um, just not to get repetitive. And I know um, Angie has this in her affidavit and she submitted this video, but, um, and I'm gonna share this video with you now. After, the day after Fines had a meeting with Hyde Park, which a lot of Hyde Park residents shared their concerns about the property. Uh, this is what happened at this property. I'm gonna share my screen right now. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So what you're looking at, this is a video of the Kansas City Police slash Jackson County Police officers at Mr. Fines uh, at this uh, 3120 Campbell, Campbell Street property. They are looking for a person. And uh, my background is I am an attorney. This is typical for a person who has a warrant and they're looking to collect on the warrant. And um, uh, this happened. Uh, People in the neighborhood question why this happened, fines uh, denied that this event ever took place, even though we had uh, documentation via video and photography of this event taking place. Um, hold on a second. Here's another instance right here. This is a, a, a photograph that um, I took. This happened in August, I believe, August or late July, where one of Mr. Fine's um, tenants, um, I mean, from what I've heard from his other tenants is that he mixed his alcohol with his pills that caused him to do an OD of some sort. And this is uh, what occurred um, midnight, I believe on a weekday. And one of his tenants was rushed to the hospital. Thankfully he survived, but in the rules that he has that shows that there's no alcohol or drug use at his premises, this is clear evidence that shows that that is not the case. And one more thing. Uh, just give me a second. This is, this video here um, is a video that you could tell was taken in August of this year. And this was in the middle of the night around uh, midnight. And, um, Basically, there was a, a woman and a man that appeared at his premises, this car. He's not using the driveway. He's driving right on the sidewalk. And um, they, you know, entered the premises at this time. This is behavior that we see quite often, even though it's a different car each time. Um, and so on his rules where he states that people can't have uh, other people, other guests over at his premises at a certain time, 
this uh, completely disproves it. Not to say that um, you know we are so antiquated that we believe that people shouldn't have have people or guests over at a time after 10 p.m. But with this type of situation and this type of behavior, um, it is not healthy for a neighborhood who currently does have children um, living here. And a lot of people are working to make this neighborhood more, uh, you know, back to where it was, where it's a primarily single family household, that this type of behavior is unacceptable. And that's all. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Joseph, how many uh, more participants do we have? A few people lowered their hands, but the only one remaining is Joshua Russell. No, it's um... Okay, Joshua, please state your full name and address. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Joshua Russell. I live at 3401 Harrison Street. Um, I, I unfortunately ha have to leave pretty soon to go pick up my boys. Um, and so my comments particularly uh, pertain to the 3401 Campbell uh, residents. I just wanted to make sure I got to say them before I have to leave. Um, I... We've asked that we keep the uh, comments related to the address that we are discussing. I understand that, but I've been on this call for the last four something hours and I need to leave uh, to go pick up my children. Uh, this, per my comment pertains to the safety of my children in relation to the 3401 Campbell property. I would really appreciate it if you would let me speak. Uh, Joseph, if you could make your comments very brief, because we have asked every participant that has been waiting to wait. We're taking these items one address at a time. I do understand your urgency. So at this one case, could you please keep it very brief as we want to follow um, the just the guidelines that we've articulated for each one of these. I understand that. Thank you for letting me talk. Um, again, I live at 3401 uh, Harrison. My uh, property is two houses to the east of 31, 3401 Campbell. Uh, again, I have two children. I have twin boys, age six, one of whom has a genetic disorder and has special, uh, has, um, special needs because of it. Um, the tenants of 3401 Campbell Street currently, uh, seven of them are registered on the USDOJ's National Sex Offenders Registry. That represents 10% of the registered sex offenders in my zip code of 64109. Um, I see people walking back and forth from that property to the liquor store, not too far from my house. Uh, which happens to be walking by my property, oftentimes with open containers. These are people who, again, are set registered sex offenders, some of whom have cases against children. My children are not safe with those people in my neighborhood. The house to the northeast corner of that property also has a family with young children. The house to the northwest corner of that property also has a family with young children. This is not a safe situation. There is no care taken for the type of people who are put into that home. Um, it's very clear that Mr. Fine is seeking a specific type of person for that property, or at the very least, allowing a specific type of person to be put in that property in the midst of a, a neighborhood full of families with young children. This is not a tenable situation. And by allowing him to continue to do this, the city would be implicitly um, uh, supporting this type of behavior. So I would appreciate all of you, all of the commissioners um, and all of the people on this call uh, to take that into consideration when, consi when making a decision regarding the 3401 Campbell property. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, at this time, we're gonna uh, close. Madam, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Um, right after we announced Joshua Russell, Angie Split Gerber, 
messaged me and said that she still wanted to speak. Okay. Okay, apologies. I think I was still promoted so I couldn't have put my hand back up or whatever. Um, one real quick point I wanted to make is just that um, we recently confronted a situation um, in front of the BZA where a um, short-term rental operator was seeking a, a variance, I think it ended up being, it could have been a special use permit to um, put up to 14 people in the short-term rental and the BZA did determine that that was inappropriate for our neighborhood. So I, I think that applies um, with regard to all of these properties that we're discussing today. And I just wanted to add that. Um, I also ask um, Madam Chair that um, you admit my letter that is um, the notarized testimony that is attached to the staff report. I'm sorry, did I lose you? Oh, I'm here. Say it one more time, Angela, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I, I move to admit my um, my letter with my notarized testimony and exhibits that's attached to the staff report. Okay. Um, I can help with that, Chair. Um, if they're attached to the staff report, they are admitted by uh, uh, automatically. Okay, thank you so much, Chris. Um, mm -hmm. Just a couple quick things. Um, the calls for service to that property are located at page 140 and 141 for this property. Um, page 48 um, has um, some additional photographs um, regarding unpermitted construction. Um, the um, photo supporting this lake's video regarding um, the police showing up the morning after our Hyde Park neighborhood meeting is on page 45, as well as uh, Mr. Fine's denial to the Neighborhood Association that it ever happened is page 169. Um, and uh, also on page 118, um, there is uh, the documentation showing that Mr. Fine actually purchased that property in November of 2015. And um, with that, I just ask that you deny this special use permit. Um, Mr. Charles Lee is still here with me as well from 3412 Campbell. He um, basically just wants to say that he concurs with the testimony from the neighbors asking for denial. And I apologize for admitting again, or omitting again to say that my address is 3341 Campbell. Thank you. Madam Chair, one additional person has raised their hand, uh, George Moss. Would you like to me to admit him or promote him? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I this I just wanted to uh, concur with uh, everybody before that is uh, urging you to not approve these. That's all. And I I know time is short, so thank you. Yeah, and I'll oh, and my wife. Um, I I also want to concur with Alan Hawquist and and Angie Split Gerber particularly. I was not able to attend the September fifteenth meeting, but I did give uh, Angela my proxy at that time, and so I'm just here showing you that yes, um, what they're saying is correct. That that um, we do have a problem with these um, group houses, group houses, or whatever you want to call them. Um, in general, we we have a problem in our neighborhood that we have too much of this. I'm not opposed to them in general. And in fact, we have um, a, a similar sort of situation with the uh, City Union Mission right next to our house. And I support them. They've been good neighbors and they generally not always, but uh, generally we've had no problem with the neighbors there. So that's just to let you know that um, that it's okay to have some of this, but we've got too much at this time and we certainly don't need more, we need less. That's all, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, we will close uh, public testimony at this time. Um, Mr. Fine, as an applicant, you will have uh, you know three to five minutes to respond to any new um, comments by participants, if you so choose. Uh, Madam Chairman, um, I've heard so many lies. 
I'm, I'm looking at my deed. I bought the house in April 2017. Uh, I mean, it's, it doesn't really matter when I bought it. It's just, it just this is a, an example of, of the stuff that goes on. And I'm also looking at the, um, uh, the police. Uh, I had a meeting with uh, Officer Ryan and Officer um, Trevor Singer. Um, there has been uh, there's been uh, several ambulance calls from I'm looking at the report uh, from May 1st to August 31st. Um, there's been nothing else except ambulance calls. And there was two heart patients living there at the time. And um, unfortunately, they both passed away this past year. One was severe heart problems, high blood pressure. The other one was major diabetes, and he passed away uh, with a heart attack. But anyways, there's been no police calls there at, at all. I'm looking at the report here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, my, uh, I guess you can't see it, but this is what I received from Officer Singer. So I'm just hearing so many lies. Um, also, um, I'd like to read this letter real quick. This letter is regard to Mr. Fine and his various properties he owns and oversees in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. My name is Dar Darren Sedger Will, and I'm the main uh, administrator of the Christian Life Program at City Union Mission. Our program is a year long residential program for men trying to change their future after making a wide variety of mistakes in the past. These mistakes range from addiction, homelessness, uh, mental health issues, and, and incarceration. Mr. Fine has helped many of our men find housing solutions to their personal living space struggles. Many landlords in the city will not help these men get back on their feet, but Mr. Fine will. I'm very appreciative his assistance to the men of the City Union Mission Christian Life Program. And again, he stated that it's a year long program and that these do include sex offenders. I've been completely transparent. Everybody's saying that I'm such a big liar and I don't know why. I'm totally transparent. I know there's sex offenders there. There's, they're on the city registry. They're, they're, um, uh, they're on file with the, the Sheriff's Department of the state of Missouri and the uh, federal uh, government. Um, but if, but I do understand there's a lot of opposition to sex offenders there. And I would stipulate that I will not rent to sex offenders any longer because that's the, um, the majority opinion of, of all of the opinions of the um the Hyde Park uh, area. But anyway, I just want to make just I'm not trying to lie. Everybody's calling me a liar. And it's, it's very hurtful. Mr. Um, yes, we, we acknowledge and understand. Thank you um, for providing. Thank you. Yes. OK, at this time, um, I would like to open just a discussion just amongst the commissioners. It seems that from what I've heard, um, Mr. Fine has been willing to um, adhere to Commissioner Sandowski's um, stipulation on condition two to take it from 10 to seven people. So I guess what is the matter before us is, do we think that this, um, that docket item 10 and with the existing codes can have up to five people, a special use permit if approved would add an additional two people. Are the um, the new condition to a stipulation? So, just wanted to hear from the pleasure of the commission whether they felt that a special use permit was in order for, for Dr. Madam Chair. Could I ask for a clarification? Uh, because I'm hearing that this is not 30 day rentals. It sounds like he's renting for a longer <coughs> period of time. So is that what we're doing? He just rents a year lease with these people or are they 30 day leases? Uh, 
Joseph or Christopher, you can speak to this, but my understanding is that it's one month to three months, but he is permitted to have to lease rent um, property to five individuals that are not related. Is that my understanding? Is that correct? We've got some other conversation in the background. Somebody's not muted. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, he can rent up to five individuals who are unrelated by right. Um, the city defines long term as anything that's more than 30 days uh, because anything that's sh considered short term is defined as anything less than 30 days. Uh, it'd be similar if you were in an apartment complex and your lease is expired and you went to a month-to-month -month rental with that uh, complex. It's very similar in nature to that. So as long as they're renting on at least a month basis, it's technically considered long-term rental by city code. And I will add, we did add stipulations in the conditions that prohibit advertising on short-term rental websites and the use as a short-term rental uh, unless there's a, f a future entitlement process sought by Mr. Fine. So I just wanted to make the comment that, you know, I wanted to see where we were at in terms of the numbers. 10 just seemed way too high for me. Um, and I would maybe argue that seven is too high. I, I think when I look at these properties and um, being pretty familiar with a lot of these housing types, five bedrooms is really the maximum in looking at the scale of this house and a lot of houses like it. Um, you get above five bedrooms and you're really squeezing people in. And when you talk about that many unrelated individuals, I mean, every, everybody knows that story of having roommates and to have that many people in one space. It's, it's very difficult. Um, and then I just would echo comments that we all made before where it just the group living stipulation, I just don't feel like this fits, fits the intent. So um, I, I just, for the same reasons that I said previously, I, I still don't feel like I support this. Um, I think he can get a lot of um, income with five bedrooms with five individuals. I, I would second that, I think. Adding on to my comments beforehand, I think five is current is is currently enough given the lack of kind of clarity on what this type of group home living does and the um, uh, critiques or uh, questions about um, the applicant's ability to run these properties. Um, I do want to make a point though that this body does not decide whether someone a certain type of person is wanted in a neighborhood um, and that this is solely a decision based on like I just said the the uh, use of the property and so I, I wanted to make that clear because that is not necessarily my intention when I vote um, that we don't decide what type of people live in properties we decide the use of that property in the zoning around it. Commissioner Hill, it's uh, Commissioner Allender. I, I echo the same um, response that I had on the last case with regards to, I think there should be a, a special, a, a different type of policy for a group living for this type of um, application. Um, and I also just want to listen to the the residents living around the around the uh, community here. I don't think we've heard one that is supportive, and there's a few more concerns that were raised. I think uh, even with this lot round of testimony. So again, I I will not be supportive of uh, staff recommendations on case ten. Commissioner Allen, would you like to make a motion? Sure. Uh, uh, Commissioner Hill, I, I uh, move, move that um, uh, case number 10 be denied. There's been a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second it by uh, Commissioner Sandowski. Um, Lisa, can you call for the vote? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Aye. 
Crow. Oh, Lord. I'm sorry. Enders. Aye. Hill. Aye. Rojas. Commissioner Rojas. Commissioner Rojas, I think you're muted. Okay, aye. And Commissioner Sadowski. Aye. <clears throat> All right, um, docket item number 10, uh, the, the motion carries to deny um, 7-0. All right, um, I, I have a, a process question, um, Joseph. Mm -hmm. and, um, I appreciate everybody giving me just a little level of grace. Uh, we have heard a lot of testimony from docket items 8, 9, and 10, and I'm just curious is um, for 11 and 12, um, if we want to consider just the commission hearing those cases together um, and, and limiting the additional testimony. It seems from the prior cases, they've all kind of treaded around the same, um, same things around uh, neighborhood uh, fabric and conditions, the quality of um, the, uh, the infrastructure and this ability to house up to 10 or 14 people. So I'm just curious um, as a way to get to the other docket items that may have people waiting to be heard. Um, I don't have a problem with doing that. I know Chris has two separate okay. um, presentations. And of course, there would be two separate motions you would need to make. Okay. All right. Well, maybe I can just just ask for um, as as it relates to the applicant and public testimony, if you could just make your comments brief, and if it's something we've already heard before around the other um, properties, that we we limit those so we can get through both of these fairly quickly. Do you want me to call them both at the same time, Madam Chair? Um. You know, we'll, we'll take them one by one. We'll, we'll follow the process. Okay. Docket item Madam. case SUP 2020-00018, request to approve a special use permit for group living at 3401 Campbell. Christopher Geary, staff planner. Good afternoon, commissioners. Again, Christopher Huey, staff planner, uh, reporting on sp this particular special use permit for 3401 Campbell Street for the approval of a group living general use. Uh, the property is already zoned R1.5, so a rezoning application is not required for this particular site. Uh, again, generally in the same general neighborhoods as we've been discussing uh, previously today. Here is a site um, location map for you. Um, here's a street view image um, to give some kind of context and uh, talking with the applicant. This was originally constructed as a fourplex, was down converted to a duplex and was down converted again to a single family home. Um, just to give you some clarity because of the way it's constructed does maintain that kind of original uh, multi unit uh, architectural and feel. <clears throat> Um, similar again, this is for a group living use. Um, the zoning code requires a special use permit for any for more than uh, five persons that are unrelated living in one dwelling unit. Uh, this particular property has currently 10 bedrooms in it. So staff is recommending a limitation of 10 persons uh, live at the site at any one time. Um, Again, similar definitions and conditions and analysis criteria we've been using for the previous conditions. This particular site has about 8,400 square feet, which would allow up to 16.8 or 17 people to live on site based on the <laughs> criteria of the code. Um, <clears throat> again, we would be, the code would allow up to 17 persons, provide there are no further limitations by the building or fire code. Um, the area is located in a historically single family area. There are apartment complexes or multi-unit uh, apartments in the immediate 
vicinity, especially just due south of this particular site. <clears throat> uh, the applicant will be maintaining the existing neighborhood character. And further in this particular site, this one is located in the North Hyde Park uh, Historic District. So any exterior changes made by the owner or applicant would be likely be necess necessitate a certificate of appropriateness by the city's Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, for this particular site, it's the same uh, 19 general letters, additional letters of opposition we've received. No specific uh, one uh, site selective letters have been submitted for this particular site. So with that, staff does recommend approval of this particular special use permit. Uh, very similar conditions to as before. Again, here in condition number two, we're asking for a amendment to limit it down to 10 persons living on, on the site at any one time. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, Christopher. Um, commissioners, are there any questions for Christopher? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Mr. Fine, are there any additional comments you would like to make relative to this property? No, ma'am. Uh, it's, uh, uh, oh, it's just, um, yes, it, it was a, a fourplex. And it was uh, basically, I'm just patting myself on the back real quick. Um, it was condemned. People were um, st uh, living in their squatters. They were, they were uh, putting um, uh, fires to keep warm on the front porch. But anyways, I turned it uh, into a single family dwelling and refurnished the ref did the whole thing so it's it's a it's a wonderful beautiful it's a beautiful house as you saw in the pictures but thank you so much for your time thank you mr are there any questions <clears throat> no i'm 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 done okay. thank you all right at this time uh joseph do we have anyone uh, raising their hand for public testimony we have Gabriel Reed followed by Ronald Porter and then Angela Splitgerber. Okay, uh, we'll take the first participant. Please uh, keep your comments um, uh, directed to the, the property at hand. And if you could be brief um, and not reiterate many of the same complaints we've heard for the other properties that we have documented carry over to these next two additional properties. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, after five hours of this, I'll be happy to be brief. Um, I have three things to sort of speak to. Uh, one point of clarification on the docket. Um, it says there's an approval for up to eight people living there. And in the presentation, it said 10. So I would like a point of clarification about that. Um, I also, uh, in, the, uh, in the longer format of the docket, it, there's a parking issue clarification. This property has no garage. Um, and what it does have is what may be the width of a two car driveway that has significant structures falling down, concrete structures. I'm, um, I live at 3402 Harrison Street, so I'm immediately next door. Um, and so additionally, there's an eight foot drop off um, with no fencing. Uh, so it is, it is dangerous for both the tenants, um, for the cars. I bring this up because it has produced problems. Last week, a trailer was stolen from there there was a truck parked there unlicensed with no plates for eight months. Um, it's an area that looks like it's not cared for and it also institutes additional problems uh, with people hanging out there. So I think that needs to be addressed uh, as part of this process. Um, I do wanna say uh, one thing that was brought up earlier, it was a question of fire code. And um, I wanna support the process of re-examining the protocols for group living, um, but Fire code's really important in this case because um, I actually went through the process of restoring this home and turning it into a duplex. And when you do that, you actually have to make a significant investment into the home. And the reason you do that is because each unit can only have up to five people living there. You know, So this is a way to skirt fire code specifically and that needs to be addressed as part of city planning. Um, and lastly, I work in underserved communities and I wanna speak to the issue of sex offenders and or tenants because one of the commissioners brought up that um, 
this is actually about enforcing code and not about enforcing the kind of people who live in a neighborhood. And I fundamentally support that because that's what the code is supposed to do. So I call to ask people for a process of compassion for the tenants of these properties because we have no tenant records, we have no tenant testimony, we have no you know, inside look at what it's actually like to live in these homes. I live next to it, I have a unique inside look at it. Much of this has been mentioned already, I won't go into specific examples, but I think there needs to be a lot of compassion for the reason that we enforce these rules in the first place. It's actually to protect people. This conversation has been one-sided to homeowners and neighborhood associations and everything else. I take Robert Fine at his word that he's a good person and he entered into this uh, to you know, have a business and help people. But the way he's running this does not. And the reason that we enforce these things is actually to support the people living in the homes. So there's good reasons for denial, but that in my view is the best and most compassionate reason. It's not property value or codes or city planning. It's actually about supporting people. So I think that the city needs this kind of housing and I think that we need to really look hard at the kind of rules and laws and enforcement you need to actually make living conditions that are really good because I've witnessed firsthand really negative living conditions. And I'll omit um, the specifics around that. Uh, they've been mentioned many times, but they're very real. And at this property in particular, I think they're really uh, heightened. Uh, so I thank everybody for their time. Uh, and I just ask that you would uh, deny uh, this variance uh, moving forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Could the next participant come forward? Please give your full name and property address. Hi, my name is Ronald Porter. Uh, my wife, Melissa, and I, we live at 3334 Campbell Street. Uh, it's literally just 300 feet away from the property at um, 3401 Campbell Street. And so I just want to echo, number one, I'll try and be quick. I know that we've uh, spent a good amount of time already on testimonies, but I want to echo what Joshua Russell was saying. Um, he's a father of two, um, we're um, parents, and so we've got four kids, uh, all between the ages of two and seven, and so we're busy, um, but again, uh, we just moved into, into the neighborhood just, you know, I think it was six months ago or so, and so this is, you know, to speak to what Commissioner Hill was saying, um, wanting to have families that come into this neighborhood and invest in the neighborhood, we saw that this was a great street. We saw that the neighbors were nice and uh, that this was a house that could be renovated and that we could live in and raise our children in. And so um, you can understand, I think anybody's, a, you know, for the parents on here, you can understand the concern I had when I later found out uh, that there's seven convicted, you know, registered sex offenders just a few hundred feet away from our house. It's an obvious concern because we want to raise our children where they can go out in the front yard and we know our neighbors, you know what I mean? And we can be friend and there doesn't have to be any kind of safety concern. Uh, that's the vision I have for this neighborhood. And uh, I'm hoping more families move in. But again, when we consolidate that much <laughs> into a neighborhood that um, by and large is um, comprised of single families or, you know, it is very diverse, but we don't have a whole lot of apart, you know, apartments on this street. Um, just a lot of families and, and couples, um, you can see the concern there. So that's all I'll say about that. But then also, you know, there was a concern, um, I'm in the military and it was just a few months ago. I just got back a couple of weeks ago, but while I was gone, um, my wife was telling, was talking about some of the things that had been mentioned to some other people that police are called pretty regularly there. And then specifically, we had a neighborhood um, video call and we had two of them. Uh, the first one I got on and I voiced my opposition to the neighborhood um, for the reason, reasons I just stated. And it was just, uh, I doubt that it was coincidence, but it was just odd that one of um, Mr. Fine's maintenance guys uh, came to my house the next day, saw my wife and children out in the front yard confronted my wife and was asking about me personally, like what my name was and how long we'd been living there and things like that. So again, I, you know, I don't know anything about Mr. Fine aside from what we're talking about here. It's nothing personal, but I just hope that, you know, people can understand the concern I have as a father of four um, and somebody that might have to go and do training for the military. Again, that's just the last thing I want to think about is are my children and my wife safe while I'm away serving. So just please consider that. Thank you, Mr. Porter, and thank you for your service. Next person is Allie Moses. Allie, 
Ali, if you'll please come forward and state your full name and address. Hi, this is Ali Moses. I live at 3335 Campbell. Um, and I'm sort of just catty corner from this property. Um, again, uh, we are a single family home. Um, we have a, a small child who's just about to turn two years old and just sort of to echo what, what some of the other parents have said on here. It was very concerning to find out um, that we have um, registered sex offenders living, um, a lot of them, <laughs> especially at this property so near to our house. Um, it, it just seems like a strange concentration to me. Like why, why do we have that many of them there? Um, but I also just wanna express um, my support for um, what some of the other residents have said. And um, I, again, I don't wanna repeat and draw this call out more, but um, I, I support what everybody else is saying um, about you know, the reasons behind why we don't want this increased um, residential capacity in this area. Um, and, it, and just about the way Mr. Fine's properties have been run. Um, I, I don't have any good faith that this would improve later. Um, and so it, it just is very concerning to me as a mother and a resident of this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph, Madam, yes, yes, sir. As soon as I get ready to say, we only have one left, a second hand popped up. Angie Split Gerber was next. Angie, please step forward. Okay, I think I'm here. Um, Angie Split Gerber, 3341 Campbell. I am actually across the street, just straight across 34th Street from this property. Um, I will keep my comments limited to things that have not been discussed. Um, I began um, in 2017 um, by meeting with Diane Binkley and then lodging a 311 complaint about the comings and goings from this property. Um, it became very apparent to me that there were a lot of people, a lot of turnover and a lot of problems associated with it. Um, as you know, in my letter, I have four pages of calls for service from 3401 Campbell. Um, I want to talk personally, though, about a couple things. Um, first of all, like it, it's basic stuff. At this property, um, a lot of times they'll throw their extra trash in front of the vacant house across the street, and then the city won't pick it up because they don't want to buy $2 trash tags. And then we have trash and garbage torn up by animals and scattered all over the place. Um, I mean, just this summer recently, um, there was trash sitting there for over a month um, that didn't get picked up. Gabriel mentioned the driveway in disrepair. Um, there have been several deaths at that property. Um, I don't know the circumstances around those, but I also don't believe that I can trust um, the reasons given for those. And regardless of that, the individual who has basically been every single call for service since May or March, I can't remember now, but it's in my letter, um, is still living there. So um, there's still a lot of chaos and calls for service um, associated with this property. Um, you know, putting aside the sex offender issue, again, the, the, the concentration of people in a single family home um, is excessive um, at 10. It needs to be five. Um, and what we see here with regard to that um, is that the rules are not helping. I will tell you that um, with regard to this property in the last several weeks, um, I, I don't know when these rules from Mr. Fine went into effect, but I am observing people sitting in cars and um, lighting stuff in, in multiple lighting. And those of us who live in drug neighborhoods know what's going on in those cars. There were people drinking in the street um, on Friday night this weekend. Um, so apparently maybe they're following his rules not to do it at the house. They're just coming out to literally sit in their cars or stand in the street next to their cars in order to do these activities. That is not an improvement and it does not solve the problems. Um, in addition, um, I do want to note that in um, page 169 of the staff report, there's an email from the City Union Mission because, um, as Claudia mentioned, there's a very good um, apartment building run by the City Union Mission just a block over on 33rd Street. I reached out to them to ask them um, about their so-called support for Mr. Fine. This was after um, he declared that he had a letter from them. 
And um, you can read that for yourself, but essentially the director of the city union mission is saying, we don't really know what the letter was for. Yeah, some of our folks have lived there. We don't work with him. Um, it's all between him and the tenant. And um, I think Gabriel made a really good point that you know we're talking about protecting people. Um, and the people in these buildings do matter. Um, they're calling 911 you know, this year for domestic violence, assault, assault, um, all sorts of things. I mean, they're, they're living with people who are dying. Um, there are two deaths in one year. And Mr. Fine's solution to that is, um, I think in page six of the staff report, where he has his letter at the very bottom of the first page and he just tells us, well, hey, I'd like to apologize to Hyde Park for all the serial 911 calls um, because most of them are from drunk tenants arguing amongst themselves. Um, that is a pretty telling admission as to what is going on with these properties. And it hasn't stopped with whatever this little list of rules is, except for, of course, he's trying to suppress the calls now. So. Um, with regard to that, I just would ask again that, that you deny the excessive number of people. We aren't against renters in this neighborhood. Um, we understand that five people who are unrelated can rent a property and that's fine. That's code. But more than that, two times, three times that is excessive and it creates the problems that we've discussed. Um, in addition, Mr. Lee is still here with me from 3412 Campbell, and he wants to say that he you know prefers, Angela, and I'm, I'm done. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but at this yeah. time, um, I'm going to just make the decision to close public testimony right now. Um, I'm going to move to uh, Mr. Fine and say, Mr. Fine, if you could be brief in your comments, I really want to get to the uh, commissioners having some discussions. There are some things that I would like to add, and then I would like us to vote on this. So I'm going to close public testimony and Mr. Fine, if there is something specific, re specifically related to any claims that have been made that you feel compelled to make a statement about, please make that statement now. Um, the only couple things is um, I'm looking at the police. Um, it's called a, a um, list of events and the only events that's happened there, again, Mr. Singer from the, the, the police department gave me this list. There's only been an ambulance call and somebody did steal a trailer from the uh, from the parking. Um, that's it. I don't know where she's getting this, her her uh, notary and stuff. It's just it, it's just not true. And then, um, yes, my my rules do say uh, please do not uh, call 911 for non emergency because uh, for example, one guy, he was missing his earphones and he thought somebody stole it. He, but anyways, he, he left him on the front step. So that's why I'm saying don't call 911. Of course you need to call 911 for emergency. Shame on uh, um, them for reading other into my rules. They're just exaggeration. Okay, I'm done. Thank you so much, Ms. Chairman. Okay. okay. Commissioners, um, I wanted to uh, move us to discussion because I think there's a couple of things that um, that have been introduced by Commissioner Baker that I do agree with. Um, I uh, support, as you guys know, community engagement. I would like us to start thinking about how do we state um, and how do we support engagement as it relates to the codes, as it relates to um, elements of the docket and not around the types of behaviors that tenants are making. They um, do not have the opportunity to be here today to uh, defend themselves. Uh, certainly any resident deserves the right to call 911 if they feel like it's an emergency. Certainly people have the right to have visitors over at their, their homes that they're paying rent at. Certainly there's opportunities for people to still feel like they can pull up and sit in their car. I do understand safety. I do understand the concerns that have been made, but I do not want this to be a time where people feel like they can just berate people uh, based on their lifestyles being very different. 
So I just, um, that's something that just really, uh, I wanted to keep the process open and, but make sure that uh, Joseph, I don't know if that's something that the commission or just something that we need to do to make sure we're tracking, tracking that type of behavior. Cause that was very difficult for me to sit through um, the complaints. So uh, moving forward, commissioners, if you have any comments or if there's a motion, um, definitely want to entertain that. Um, I think my my comments are just <clears throat> the same as the other ones. I, I'm not in support of this as it stands currently. So um, I don't know if anyone else has any comments, but I, I'll be willing to make a motion. Please do. Uh, I move to deny um, docket item number 12. I'll second. I think... Madam Chair, you were docket on, you were on docket item 11. Yeah, you oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, I, I move to deny docket item 11. Yeah, I'll second that one too. Okay. It's been moved and second. Um, Lisa, will you call for the vote? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. Rojas? We can't hear you, Commissioner Rojas. Okay. And Sadowski? Gotcha. Thank you. It's um, the motion for denial passes for docket item 11. Um, Joseph, um, we can move on to docket item 12. Okay, docket item 12, case number SUP 2020-00014, a request for approval of special use permit for group living at 3112 Charlotte. Christopher Huey, staff cleaner. Good afternoon, Commission Christopher Huey. <clears throat> Christopher Huey, once again. Um, get my presentation going here. Uh, again, today we have the last in the kind of similar caseload of a special use permit for group living general use at 3112 Charlotte Street. The property is zoned currently R1.5 and does not require a rezone, a companion rezoning case. Again, similar, similar neighborhoods uh, for that have been considered previously. Here's the specific site plan. And a photo of the home in question. Uh, again, so the applicant is proposing to rent out individual rooms on a uh, individual basis. Uh, this classifies as a group living use since there is more than five persons uh, living under one dwelling unit roof. This particular home features six bedrooms and uh, with you know the standard common area elements. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, again, here are the similar definitions for household and group living. This particular site has about 44, almost 4,500 square feet, which equates to 8.9 persons or rounded up to full nine people that would be permitted to live on site under the um, land use rec recommendations of the city zoning development code. Um, in this particular area, there are, well, this particular, yes, yeah, you mean this particular area, there are several converted multifamily and two-family homes. Additionally, just due west of this particular site is a M15 zoning district, which is a kind of traditionally light industrial light manufacturing district. Um, typically, staff looks at higher density uses as a potential transition zone from a commercial property to a more lower density or single family zone as kind of a uh, general hierarchy. The applicant is pr proposing to maintain the existing character and existing traditions of the home. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, while there's only, well, from according to city records, there appears to be only immediately adjacent single family homes. We do find examples of two and four family dwelling units uh, or dwelling unit homes within the area. For this particular property, we've uh, the same general additional 19 letters of opposition. 
as well as nine letters for this specific site. The staff does support this use of giving the uh, transitional uses we've kind of described. Um, we do have, again, a, a minor amendment to condition number two to uh, pull it down to nine people in total living on the property. And with that, again, I will conclude, conclude my presentation. Thank you. Are there any question, questions uh, um, from commissioners to Christopher? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Mr. Fine, as the applicant, um, is there any additional information you would like to present about this property to the commission? All right, I'm gonna take that as a no, Mr. Fine, unless you just are not sure that you're muted. Just one more thing. I'm looking at the list of events again that I got from Officer Singer. He's the the police the police uh, man that handles the group housing. Um, there was one um, uh, uh, one list of events, uh, no report. So um, basically, uh, you're going to hear Mr. Callender speak in a minute. He sits across the street. And when people, I have three houses in a row right across the street from him. But anyways, basically he um, sends me pictures constantly um, about people parking on the street. Um, he's, uh, he's called um, me a slumlord. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna read just real quick and then I'll be done. Mr. Finley, um, if you wanna, limit your comments to about the property, you will have a chance to respond to any comments by um, our participants that want to speak on, on this case, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Commission. I'm new to this, but I, I'm done then. Thank you. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Now, will um, Joseph, or is there anyone that would like to give public testimony? And I would ask that the um, participants or participants that speak specifically to this address um, and that um, have some new insight and not what we've heard before around all of the properties. And if you could keep your comments focused on what this commission and this body is here to assess, that would be helpful. Madam Chair, I, the first person promoted is uh, George Moss and then Jeff Callender will be second. George, if you would um, give us your full name and address. Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I I don't know how I got on the docket, but um, I once again we need less of these um, uh, multi multi family units or group houses, not more. That's all. Thank you. Next participant. It's Jeff Callender. Next up is Lindsay Glasser. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Callender. I live with my wife, Lindsay Glasser, at 3119 Charlotte. Um, as Mr. Fine just said a moment ago, he does have uh, three units across the street, actually four units on my block. Um, of them, two of the four are designated as group living currently. I don't know how many people he has in there. Um, and then he's looking for the group living uh, special use permit for 3112 Charlotte. And then he also has a duplex at 3126 Charlotte, which he is currently adding on to. Uh, unclear how many people are living in there as well. Um, I won't reiterate things that have already been said. Uh, I would just like to point out that, as far as I can tell, the opposition to, to Robert Fine's plan has been universal. Um, there has not been, as absent some letters that he has produced himself, that no one has spoken for him. Um, second, I would like to address uh, Mr. Huey's uh, staff recommendation, and he talks about the, the medium or the higher density assists in the transition to the single family housing um, and supposedly confers some sort of benefit 
on the neighborhood by shielding us from the light industrial. Truthfully, the, the light industrial are excellent neighbors, um, and it's quickly turning over into shops and restaurants. Um, the problem on the block is Robert Fine's houses. Um, we, I think everyone on our street would be content to live next to the light industrial. Um, third, I would like to address that this is not anti-renter. Uh, we have plenty of renters in our neighborhood. Uh, further, our neighborhood supported uh, the building of the low-income housing that's currently going up along Harrison Street between 31st and Linwood. The issue is not low income. The issue is not the people that they're, the issue is not that it's low income and it's not even necessarily the lifestyle choices of the people he brings in. The issue is that the places that we support have been places where there's someone running it. There's an institution behind it. There is a licensed organization that is making sure what goes on there. Um, as much as Robert Fine is a blight upon our neighborhood, um, it's the, the lifestyle, the living conditions that he provides to these people are also not adequate. He is charging outrageous rents. This is not low income housing. He, you know, he compares in his prices, he compares it to what it would cost to stay in a hotel. Not mentioning the fact that I don't know how big are these rooms, two or 300 square feet, and he's charging seven, eight hundred dollars a month for them. Um, finally, um, or a couple other points, Mr. Fine does go back and forth from whether or not he's renting to medical interns to people from the city union mission. Um, I think that's clear to everyone that the story changes depending on whatever the question is. Um, and for the fifth one, I, I don't know that I've ever sent any pictures to Robert Fine. Um, is outside of all of that, uh, I would, my wife would, and uh, it was actually me who organized the meeting on our block where Councilman Bunch attended, Captain Simons of the Kansas City Police attended because of the number of problems that we had had with him. Um, and it's, I think that that group living, uh, he's basically found some sort of a way to slide in the, around the limit on the number of people. Um, I think that we can, or I hope that we can all agree that group living implies that there is some sort of group there, as opposed to just whomever he can round up and is willing to pay $700 cash. Um, and I would ask uh, for some further, please, we would like further clarity on that. And then to look at his usage uh, at 3110 and 3114 Charlotte, where they're classified as group living. Uh, I believe that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time. Joseph, who do we have next? Lindsay Glasser. Lindsay is my wife. I, I... Okay. Um, Hi. Can, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. I just wanted to reflect that I agree with the sentiments expressed for all the other properties. One thing that's unique to the, this property in particular is that Mr. Fine does have three other properties on the block. So while I understand we're looking at them individually, that is something to consider that this isn't one group home or the request for one group home on a block of all residential. Um, it seems like there's been a lot of testimony about his character. And so I just wanted to bring that to light as well, that this is one of four on our block and I appreciate all your guys' time, so thank you. And, and if I may, uh, part of the issue with the four houses on the block is it affects or it functions like a business or like a campus. The calendar, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you because I'm not sure if those properties will come before us. So I wanna keep it um, just strict, strictly focused on the property at hand. Okay. Um, the um, and yeah. And I will say one other thing, and this was in my letter, um, Robert Fine's tenants have acted intimidating towards us. Uh, I put in my letter about there on Christmas Day where they pulled out a gun across the street and were loudly discussing about how they were always going around packing heat, uh, staring at me and my baby while they were drinking beer at 9.30 in the morning. 
Um, this right. is a thought. Thank, Thank you. you. Joseph, or is there anyone else? Yes, the last one is jo Jordan Smith. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Jordan Smith. I live at 812 East Linwood. And again, just want to amplify the voice of all the other neighbors and, and make two points to, to things that commissioners have said. One is, and Jeff did just speak to this, I apologize, which is that this is not an anti-renter thing or, or some sort of um, uh, uh, you know, denial of the idea that there may be different kinds of housing that the city needs. And, and, and that's, you know, from my perspective, that's not the problem here. It is a pattern and practice of operations and that the way in which he's trying to use group living is not in the way it would be anticipated. Instead, this is really a commercial operation. <clears throat> And, um, you know, during the recent meeting, I think it was September 20th, where um, Mr. Fine came to a neighborhood meeting where, again, as, as everybody said before, nobody was in support of these asks of his, um, that he, he basically said, well, I've saved these houses from disrepair. And, you know, I really care about this stuff. And then, you know, the point kind of came up, which is, well, you already can, you know, rent to five you know, unrelated people, like what's the problem with that? Or, or renting to families or, 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 you know, using them in a traditional way that would promote the neighborhood cohesion and the maintenance of those properties as intended. And he basically had no answer for it, which I think a lot of us took as this isn't about that. This is about something else. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, we will now close public testimony. Uh, Mr. Fine, if there is any specific um, uh, issue that you would like to address briefly. Just, just a few things, uh, uh, kind of like a rebuttal to Mr. Callender. Um, again, it, I do rent to medical students and I rent to um, interns, people from all walks of life. I'm not saying that I, I rent to um, uh, people that have problems, homeless people. I've been totally clear in the way he's talking. I'm just a big fat liar. Um, and I just, uh, and this is why I'm doing these special use permits to get in compliance with the city. Um, and I, and after today, it'll all be over and we'll, we'll get in compliance. Um, these are just a few things. He's maybe the people that get intimidated, um, by him, he sits on his front porch and takes pictures of them daily. Like I said, they, they come in and out. One guy, he's he's kind of wobbly. He's He did come from the city union mission. Lovely man, but he has a problem walking. He immediately sent me his picture and say this man is, uh, he's on drugs. Um, his his text to me, and it's, it's really, um, like I said, it, Boy, I have to have pretty thick skin to listen to this. You bring drugs and drug dealers and crime to my family's house. I will not stop. I'll call the police all the time to your houses in the past. I will not stop. You, you, you lie with every breath. I will not stop. And he sends me pictures of, of um, I will not stand for drug dealers in my house. That's crazy. But anyways, it's, I think it's called kind of like a neighborhood hysteria or something. Um, but he's the biggest um, uh, exaggerator. But, uh, but everything else is the same. Thank you very much for listening to me vent. <laughs> All right, um, we'll now transition to commissioners um, for us to have some discussion and then entertain a motion. Um, I think I was, point stands. I, I think I think just one point generally. I think um, uh, I think we should maybe consider a disclaimer before we have meetings about that there are legitimate arguments for and against these type of um, cases and that those cases should be, and those arguments should be um, made in a not dehumanizing way. And uh, we should do that at the beginning of the meeting, I would recommend, but I am not in favor of this one and I would be willing to make a motion. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I do want to provide before the commission votes here, just uh, a, a response to a comment made by Mr. Fine that after today we'll 
be done with this. Uh, that's not exactly true. The commission oh. makes, I just wanted to clarify so the audience and everyone's well aware, um, the special use permits after the commission makes their vote here today, will proceed oh. to the planning commission, or excuse me, to the board of zoning adjustments for final oh. hearing and decision. The oh. rezoning case, the one on 3704 Central, which was uh, heard today, not the one that was dismissed by the commission, will proceed on to city council. If, and I'm emphasizing if, if the council decides to approve that rezoning, then that companion special use permit will proceed on to the board of zoning adjustments. So just wanted to add some clarity that just because we're having today, we're not done yet. So I don't want to mislead the public or anyone. So thank you. Can I have clarification? Mm -hmm. Th thank you so much. I, I did not know that. I'm so sorry. Okay, that's all right. Thank you. Are there any other comments from commissioners? If not, I think Commissioner Baker is willing to make a motion. Go ahead. Um, I motion to deny case uh, 12. Second. Your second. All right, it's been moved and second. Uh, recommending denial of docket item 12. Uh, Lisa, can you take the vote? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. Rojas? Aye. Mm -hmm. And Sadowski? Aye. Thank you. The motion for denial carries for docket item 12. Um, Mr. Fine and uh, everyone who has given public testimony, thank you for your time and your patience. Um, thank you for moving through this process with us. I would, uh, my hope is that um, you all will be able to come to some level of mediation. Mr. Fine is still a property owner. Mr. Fine, I hope that you would listen to the concerns of uh, your neighbors and um, Hopefully there is a way that you all can work together since you can still rent out your properties. That is your right to rent your properties um, to tenants, but hopefully you all can work together. So thank you so much. Joseph, let's move on to the next docket item. And the next one is docket 15, case number SUP 2020-00041. Request your previous special use permit in District R 7.5 on about 70 acres located at 9201 North Indiana to allow for an addition to a school. Zach Nelson is a staff planner. Good afternoon, Zach Nelson, City Planning and Development. Um, this next case is located up north within the Shoal Creek area. A little more specifically, this is a large site um, of the North Elementary School and also the Gateway Sixth Grade Center. Um, so there are single family subdivisions to the north and south, and then to the immediate west, it's currently undeveloped. So the applicant is here today requesting a special use permit to allow for an expansion of, a, of the school, which is considered a public and civic use. Um, and this type of use with either new construction or with expansions, um, it requires a special use permit in residential zoning districts. Um, so the applicant, I know it's a little bit tough to see in this site plan, but the applicant is proposing uh, to renovate large portions of the school, the existing school, and then to build an addition here where my cursor is. Um, so on the south side of the building, and this is Northeast 92nd Street to the south here. And I'm not sure if you can see it real well, but I've provided the, the floor plan just to give you a better idea of some of the uses and how this is going to benefit the school. Um, so the addition will include several class classrooms on the western portion of the addition here um, with additional offices, um, some storage and mechanical areas, and then restrooms as well. And then the majority of the addition will be a gym here in the southeast corner. And then in terms of landscaping, the applicant is showing uh, street trees along northeast 92nd Street. And then um, kind of a planting bed with shrubs and additional landscaping on the south portion of the building itself. And then in terms of architecture, uh, the building materials will be primarily 
uh, stained precast concrete panels and brick, and it will largely match the existing architecture of the building, um, both in scale and in architecture overall. Um, and then this is the south elevation, so this will really be the uh, kind of the front building elevation that you'll see off of the street here. And then here are just some renderings I've provided that will kind of give you a better perspective of the addition, as you can see here, and then how, how it kind of fits with the overall existing building itself. So staff is supportive of this um, and recommends approval with conditions um, of this special use permit. And I provide the appro approval criteria as well. Um, I did want to mention one thing. Um, staff recommends approval with conditions and I would like to remove condition um, 1B. It pertains to additional shrubs for the existing parking. Um, since the, the parking itself isn't being, <clears throat> excuse me, isn't being expanded, um, the applicant has pointed out that this is a significant um, additional cost to the site. Um, and staff agrees that, that um, at this time, we can remove that condition, 1B. And that concludes my presentation. And Brian Hochstein, he's representing the school district, and he can answer any questions you have as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Brian. Okay. My name is Brian Hochstein with MKEC Engineering. I'm representing the North Kansas City School District. Our offices are located at 11827 West 112th Street, Overland Park, Kansas. Um, I don't really have much to add with what Zach had, but the only item uh, we had to consider was that landscaping. We worked through that. And so at this time, we agree with all, all the other stipulations and uh, ask for your consideration for approval. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, do you have any uh, questions at this time? All right, seeing none. Uh, Joseph, is there anyone who um, has raised their hand to give public testimony? No, ma'am. All right. All right, seeing that there um, is no uh, public testimony. Uh, commissioners, would you all like to make a motion at this time? Um, I can go. Uh, I'll move to approve uh, docket item number 15 uh, with conditions and subtracting uh, condition 1B or removing condition 1B. I'll second. Thank you. It's been moved and second uh, to approve docket item number 15, removing condition 1B. Uh, can we call for the vote, please, Lisa? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. Rojas? Aye. And Sadowski? Aye. Thank you. Uh, the motion uh, for approval passes unanimously. Thank you. Good luck with your project. Thank you, Commissioner. Have a great day. All right, Joseph, do we have one more? Is this our final one? This oh. is your final one. All right. It is uh, docket item 17, case number SUP 2020-00036, a request for approval special use permit in District B2-2 on about one and a half acres at 13221 State Line Road to allow for gasoline and fuel sales use. Zach Nelson is the staff planner. Good afternoon again, Zach Nelson, City Planning. Just a moment. So this next case is located um, down south within the Martin City area, uh, right off of State Line Road. So more specifically, um, this is a former Applebee's store um, just to the east of State Line Road and just south of 133rd Street. So this is Leewood um, city boundary to the west. There's a Lowe's, depart uh, Lowe's store to the east and then additional um, commercial uh, pad sites to the north and south. 
so this is looking generally south east at the site from that intersection I just pointed out. Again, this is a, a vacant Applebee's uh, former site. So the applicant is here today re requesting a special use permit uh, to allow for fuel sales. And this is for a new quick trip store. The applicant is um, proposing to demolish the current building and then construct this new quick trip. And so north is facing to the, north is to the left. Um, so State Line Road is here at the bottom of the screen. So the quick trip will face State Line Road um, with parking uh, both on the north and south sides of the building and on the west side as well. And then as you can see, several fuel pumps are located here. Um, I just, I wanted to point out one thing in my staff report, I think it says 24 fuel pumps. It's actually 14 fuel pumps. Um, and then with access um, provided off of this access road, there's two curb cuts shown. There's also kind of this service drive here. That's to allow for unloading for um, employees and things like that. Um, and I think the applicant can give you a little more information if you have any questions about that. Um, so the plan overall, it, um, it complies with most of the zoning requirements. Um, this is the landscape plan. It shows a lot of uh, screening on the north side along 131st Street, um, and then street trees along both adjacent streets, and then um, various landscaping um, throughout the site as well. Uh, one thing I did want to mention is that this does not uh, currently comply with the uh, visual screen that's required along any adjacent streets for new uh, parking areas. And so staff is requesting additional landscaping along um, this west property line along State Line Road here. Um, and then in terms of building elevations, it's pretty typical what you, um, I think we've all seen quick trips, a lot of them, so uh, brick, uh, four-sided architecture, um, just kind of what you would expect. Um, and then, so staff overall recommends approval with conditions. Um, staff believes that this is an appropriate use for this location um, and is appropriate both in character and in architecture, things like that. Um, staff does recommend removing condition uh, 1A, which pertains to the monument sign. Um, when I did my calculation, um, this pertains to the maximum square footage of that monument sign. I included the base in my initial calculation. And so after going back and reviewing that, I, I, it looks like it does comply with the, that requirement. So staff recommends approval uh, with all conditions and removing condition 1A. And with that, I can answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Zach? Um, are there conditions for sidewalks in that area or is that not included um i don't believe i included any for sidewalks but i believe oh, that they're there yeah it's like there okay cool. but if they're not up to current city standards then um, they would be required to improve those all right yeah, this is stacy Lowe from land development yes there's a condition in the report requiring sidewalks along the frontage of both the 131st street and state line road Okay, thanks, Stacy. And I, I'm guessing that would include ADA upgrades as well. Yes, any ADA upgrades will be required as well. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions for Zach? All right, Joseph, do we have an applicant that would like to um, add additional comments? Looks like there's someone named Jessica Glavis or Glavis that I would assume is with Quick Trip, so I will um, promote her. Yeah, she's representing Quick Trip. Okay. Welcome, Jessica. Get your video on. Okay, I can hear you now. Remember, sorry, we got timed out suddenly. It's been too long of a day. <laughs> so this is Patricia Jensen with the Rouse Fretz Law Firm. And with me to my left um, is Jessica Glavez with okay. Quick Trip Corporation. We're pleased to finally be, be heard today. You guys have had a long hearing. So um, I'll cover it quickly. We did, um, Zach, we sent you a PowerPoint. Did you upload that or? 
Yeah, Lisa, if you have a chance, could you share that? Well, we can share ours if you'd allow us to share our screen. It's the same one. Okay. Do that? Yeah. You should be able to. Okay. Okay, share screen. We're trying to get it up. You guys might be quicker. I can just let me know if you want me to do it. I can put it up. I have it open. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead and do it. It's not one Sorry. It's we not. can't get it. Um, real quick, as, as Zach has indicated, Quick Trip is under a purchase contract to purchase the site. Um, and as it's been noted, it is a vacant Applebee site. Um, so if you'd go to the second slide, please. First, we are not, we are in agreement with all of the staff conditions contained in your staff report. So there aren't any issues and we'll go through this quickly because we know you've had a long day. Um, the site is highlighted. Of course, across the street to the west is the state of Kansas. Um, and then this site is um, really amongst a whole uh, large uh, commercial area and it is zoned B2. We're not in here for a rezoning. We're in here requesting a special use permit because the city's code requires that any um, convenience store with gas sales receive a special use permit. So that's, that is what is in front of you today. Um, and you can see that, that is, there is a lot of commercial around us, including um, immediately to our east is a Lowe's, store and then to the southeast is a Walmart and then there are a number of other smaller commercial tenant spaces in the area. The photos show you the vacant Applebee site um, that looks directly east at it. Um, the, the slide on the right is looking north um, at the vacant Applebee's. Next slide. Um, these two photos look north from the property and one looks south from the property. And you can see there's a beauty brands building to the south of our site. Next slide. Um, this looks directly east at the lows from the property and then it looks northeast at the retail center that exists. Next slide. These are two slides looking directly north and are looking west across State Line Road and looking south along State Line Road. The next slide it shows the um, site plan plus the landscaping. And as Zach has noted, he's asked us to um, add additional landscaping um, and we've agreed to do that. The next slide is the building elevations. Um, we worked with Zach on the building elevations. It's a little different than the one he showed you because we added um, some small towers at the back of the property, the rear. The next slide, and I want to go over this. We had um, our neighborhood meeting on September 15th via Zoom call. We really heard two primary concerns from the neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood directly to the east is the Newcastle Homes Association, um, and there were two issues they asked us to, to look at. One was um, apparently because that building is vacant, there are some homeless people who um, tend to gather there at the back of the building. There's a protected brick wall at the very back, so you can get in there and probably um, get some protection from the weather. Um, we contacted the current property owner and told them that there seemed to be an issue. So that property owner was taking care of that. Um, they also had a second um, request of us and that was that they wanted us to be a conduit basically between um, them and the two city council representatives and the Department of Public Works on this issue. The slide in front of you shows the surrounding street network. Um, and 
one of the things, there was a letter that was sent to you, I believe, from Miss Lampy, who is the president of the Newcastle Home Owners Association. One of their issues is they say that they have trucks that travel um, north and south, curving, curving south along a street called Inverness, directly behind um, those commercial areas. Um, and trucks will travel there to try to shortcut some of the um, stoplights along 135th and State Line and Blue Ridge and State Line. Um, they are very interested in seeing what can be done to stop traffic from their neighborhood along 130. Um, I can't, can you see this? I don't know that you can. Um, Joe, is there a way to show where that 133rd Street is other than it's directly south of Lowe's? So that's the connection between the commercial area and Newcastle. They're interested in closing that off. Um, we were able finally to schedule a meeting that took place yesterday morning uh, with the Quick Trip folks, myself, Councilwoman Andrea Boo and Councilman Kevin McManus and a number of individuals from the Public Works Department, including the, the acting director, um, whose name is Ralph Davis and Wei Sun, um, and discussed the neighbor's concerns. Um, Public Works reached out this morning, I believe, to Ms. Lampy to schedule a meeting with them to discuss their ideas about what they want um, for that 133rd and Inverness connection, what, what type of um, blocking off that they want and, and to make sure that it is an opinion of the whole um, residential area. So that is, that's the only issue I know of that came up. We do not believe this is an issue related to Quick Trip. It's an overall issue. Um, as you know, many people frequent Quick Trip, and not necessarily as a destination place, but as they're driving by the site to get gas. Um, we believe that the traffic will come from Blue Ridge and 135th and State Line Road. Um, Quick, Trips, Quick Trips drivers and delivery vehicles will be instructed to deliver from State Line Road and not to use a connection through Inverness Drive. So with that, we would request that you recommend approval of this subject to the conditions as outlined by Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, are there any questions uh, for the applicant? This actually might be a question back to the staff. I was trying to find um, the number of parking spots that were required versus what were provided. Patricia might be able to answer that. Um, I think it's, we were providing, I can't remember, just as I got into that. 26 uh, spaces are required and a total of 50 are provided. Um, I know that you, may not like that we provide more parking than what's required, but it is parking that Quick Trip de deems necessary for its customers. Are there any other questions? Um, Joseph, did we have any um, public testimony from the audience? Uh, yes, you do. Um, Tommy Lampy. And Carol Winterroad had her hand raised as well. But I'll promote Tommy first. Thank you. Tommy, you're welcome to give your um, public testimony. Please give us your address as well. We cannot hear you if you're speaking, showing that you are still muted.
We're still not able to hear you, uh, Mr. Lampy. Uh, perhaps, Joseph, we can go to the second participant and then come back. Um, the next person that raised their hand is R. Britton Brown, Sr. Mr. Brown, please feel free to mute, unmute yourself and give your address. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I live at 400 West, 132nd Terrace. Uh, while I'm generally uh, pretty much in favor of Quick Trip, uh, I am very, very concerned about the addition of traffic through our neighborhood. Again, we're, I'm speaking in regards to Newcastle. Uh, not only do they is the, will the traffic up and down uh, north and south or in Inverness increase? But we also have a problem with 132nd Street between Warnell Road and Inverness. Traffic coming from the east on Blue Ridge has a tendency to turn south on Warnell and then make an immediate west on 132nd Terrace to cut through the, our neighborhood, our residential neighborhood, to access and will access that quick trip. Uh, this additional traffic creates a problem of speeding, not only in numbers, but sheer speeding. Uh, we've been working diligently and have uh, put in a petition for ta traffic calming devices on 132nd Street. I have personally recently clocked people at 56 miles an hour coming up 132nd Street. It's absolutely preposterous. And then they come back out of that area and they go back east on 132nd Street. And for some reason, they seem to think we're a high rate. This has got to stop. Uh, the addition of Quick Trip is going to uh, exacerbate the problem. And I, I feel very strongly about it and have to speak against it. If indeed we can get 133rd blocked off at Inverness, that would indeed cure our problem. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Lampy, are you able to unmute yourself and give testimony? Madam Chair, I'm going to guess that that uh, Tommy does not have a mic or something in, in their computer. Is it showing as unmuted, but obviously it's not working. OK, um, was Tommy the uh, last person to raise their hand to speak on this? Document? Carol Winter Road. Carol Winter Road has raised her hand. Ms. Werner World, please feel free to uh, give your testimony and offer your address as well. It's Carol. <clears throat> can you hear me? Uh, it's extremely low on my end, but maybe others can hear you. Okay, don't, move, don't mute yourself. There, there I am, but can you hear me? Because yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm Carol Winter Road. I live at 9400 Madison. I'm president of Center Planning and Development Council, which is an umbrella group of homes and neighborhood associations in the southwest part of the city. And Newcastle is one of our homes associations. Our main concern on this project is the livability of the Newcastle Homes, Associ homes uh, Association. And uh, we're very concerned that that be worked out before this is approved, because we never know if it's going to be worked out. Uh, they just had a meeting yesterday, apparently, according to Patricia Jensen. Nobody from the neighborhood was in that meeting. But we need to have a meeting, or the neighborhood has to have a meeting about this to see if that 
traffic thing can be worked out so that the neighborhood will be livable. So we're very supportive getting that done. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Railroad. Applicants, uh, would you like to, uh, sure. to, I'm sorry, is there someone else, Joseph? Someone else raised their hand. Okay, sorry about that. Could you please come forward and state your name and address? Hi, this is Katrina Foster with Councilwoman Andrea Boo's office. I was just going to affirm uh, that we we did have that meeting yesterday, and it was a staff meeting to um, to ask for for staff to reach out. And I will confirm that they did, uh, in fact, reach out to the neighborhood to try and set up a neighborhood meeting about the options to get input on what they want to try. I'm not speaking in any way for or against because that's not my place. I just felt that I should confirm that that has occurred. Okay, thank you. Joseph, is there anyone else? That's it. Okay, we will close. If I, can I interject here? Uh, we're closing, sorry, the public testimony at this time. Um, applicants. No, I, nobody reached out. I'm sorry, Mr. Brown, we are closing. I'm the, I'm the secretary of can the we, Homeowners Association. Joseph, nobody I'm reached out. Mute. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we have closed uh, public testimony at this time. I'm sorry, Mr. Brown, you had an opportunity to speak. Um, there's no attempt to limit your voice, but we wanna just follow along with our protocol. Uh, now is the time for the applicants to respond to any public testimony that it was given. Madam Chair, members of the commission, again, we request your approval of the special use permit subject to the conditions. Um, I believe Quick Trip has advocated on behalf of the neighborhood pursuant to our discussion with them in our neighborhood meeting and made and were, we were able to get the council people and public works together to discuss the larger neighborhood issue. It is not an issue related to Quick Trip. We are not going to increase the traffic going through 133rd Street. If the, if the 133rd and Inverness is blocked off, it eliminates traffic going and using 132nd Street. So it's not an issue related to Quick Trip, but we are trying to assist the neighborhood in having their voice with regards to that issue. So we would respectfully request your approval subject to the conditions um, we do have a closing deadline, so we cannot be continued for um, a period of time for public works and the neighbors to agree on what they'll do. Okay, thank you. Um, now we'll transition to a discussion from the commissioners if you have any questions um, or just discussion. I would just like to point out, I think the issues with the neighborhood can be resolved separately um, with public works. And I know Councilman Boo and McManus um, are, would, would be more than willing to kind of work on that. And Eric Bunch is fourth district and is really good at that kind of those kind of solutions as well. Um, so I would encourage the neighbors to, uh, to, to work with our council people to solve those solutions. But as um, the applicant stated, I don't think that's uh, extremely relevant to um, whether this gets moved on or not. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Commissioner Anders? Uh, I was just going to go ahead and move to approve docket item number 17, omitting 1A. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It's been moved and second. Uh, Lisa, will you call for the vote? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Baker? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. Rojas? Aye. And Sadowski? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Dyke, thank, I, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. I, uh, 
I just want to say docket item 17 has was approved unanimously with conditions removing item 1A. Thank you all. We wish you luck on your project. Joseph and commissioners, I believe that that concludes our meeting and all the items on the docket. Thank you for Madam your Chair. patience. Yes. Before you officially close, I'd like to make a brief statement. Yes, ma'am, of course. It's come to my attention that I would like to wish you a belated birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. For the commissioners, her birthday was yesterday. Thank you. Happy birthday. birthday. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, you all. If no other business before us, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Yes. Thank you. Have a good one. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. All, all. done. Bye.